I wish good things to you who's watching this. I was roasted mercilessly yesterday for my Spanish and Portuguese, so I will unashamedly try it again. Deseo cosas buenas a ti que está viendo esta transmisión. Desejo buenas cosas a você que está asistindo esta transmisión. These were just the three official languages of Copa America, the tournaments that we are about to watch. The semifinals are underway out of nine teams. Only four remain to compete for uh, the glory of being the dominant Carcassonne force in the Western Hemisphere. And these are Brazil, Argentina, Chile and Mexico. We will be focusing on the match on uh, the semifinal match be between Brazil and Argentina. Of course, we will be also looking at Chile and Mexico as well but uh first uh, just about the journeys there the tournament table that you see that's from yesterday's stream yesterday we had a group stage and we can see that brazil very narrowly managed to squeak into the semi-finals chile was dominant in group b and uh, brazil peru and uh, colombia all had only one win out of three but brazil managed to sneak in narrowly via tiebreakers and uh, argentina had a smoother path although they took a loss from guatemala i believe they took a loss from guatemala uh, but they managed to defeat everybody else including mexico and the united states However, Brazil, unlike yesterday, they brought in the big guns. I mean, of course, Brazil is always strong, but Melvin Quaresma is playing on board one, Humberto Focur is playing on board two, so uh, formerly world number two, no, world number four, another master, Gustavo Arruda, another master, Teus Gladiador, uh, te, uh, and um, the young talent with uh, Feltzera, who actually had a strong performance the other day as well. So we will be following first Sani Blader versus Fukuda because we haven't seen Fukuda for such a long time. And I believe the game has just, just started. And Sani Blader, Santiago Iniguez for um, uh, Argentina had some strong uh, world championship, uh, not world championship, but world cup performance as in the world team Congress on online championship performances back in 2023. So they're rated under 500, which is complete and not true. They were very often in their upper 700s and uh, Fukuda had achieved the title of master as well. So both players are currently underrated, of course, very strong, thinking very deeply about the game. It is the Brazilian with the red meeples who starts the game with Monastery. Sanib later the first one to get on the scoreboard with this city over here. Let me actually check if my drawings work. No, they don't. So luckily I noticed that soon enough. And of course I forgot to remove the standings, but luckily you didn't miss too much of the game. Uh, just, just, just wait a second, just wait a second. There we go, you can see my drawing. So obviously this city, uh, Fukuda equalizes on the scoreboard at the same time Meeple this monastery. And very interesting move by Sani Blader trying to Meeple a one point road next to the monastery and the city of Fukuda possibly hoping to trap his own Meeple next to two Meeple of the red player and by that they would have a net one meeple fewer trapped Well, interesting move by Fukuda. Ah, so they start a new city up top with the idea of possibly grabbing a tile like this or a triangle and then putting it over here and trapping this green meeple together with the square. But look at this, what green does. Green actually decides to trap himself, but at the same time they trap um, Red's monastery and they also trap Red's city over there. So just everybody's trapped. That's lovely. Well, now this road is sticking into this city of Fukuda, which means that Fukuda has the advantage in this mini battle. This green road is worth three points. This 
uh, Red City is worth three points, but there is a platform where the Red City can expand and expand and expand and accrue more points, whereas the Green Road is capped at three. But Fukuda decides not to take advantage of that type of thing. He actually chooses to go differently. As Sanyu Blader prevents to restrict the development of the city, Fukuda simply goes for completion. So his intent is to actually draw one of these two dagger tiles, put it over here, get 10 points for the city, and just add one point to the road of Sanyu Blader in such a way that does not give the green player a meeple back. Let's see if the red player is successful. So first of all, he would need to draw one of the two daggers that fit into this square. And uh, second, uh, he would need to dodge a blocking attack. Because I can easily imagine how Sandy Blader can now go over here, maybe. Ex this is exactly what he does. And then put some pressure on the square. And now... The Brazilian has a very interesting decision to make. So what exactly do they do? Because like, if they go over here... They can protect the square and maintain the possibility of drawing this tile. But then the question is, if you go like this, do you meeple the road and do you invest a meeple into trying to share this six-point road upon completion? Because like eventually it's gonna, the, this road is going to be like this. Only green is going to get the points. So if red wants to get the points for the road, he, he would have to place the tile over here. Uh, the meeple over here and just wait for a very very long time until red draws this tile but this creates some problems because 25 percent of the time red will not draw this tile at all and some percentage of the time red uh, will draw this tile too late to be impactful so is it even worth it Another question that the Brazilian player must be asking yourself, given, given that they ha have already spent more than 30 seconds of this move, is whether saving this square is worth it at all. Because, like, uh, it's not that this tile will give so many additional points. It's nice, but it's not a game decider. So maybe Fukuda... Ah, he decides to go for this. He decides to go for this. That's I'm surprised. That's extra greedy. I would not have done this actually, because like 25% of the time I basically lose the game. I think it's just really not worth it. But hey, this makes for a great, great content move. I don't get to complain about that. What I would have done instead is maybe I would have gone like over here and started just a plain new city. Simply use this tile as a city tile and then simply allowed Sanyu Blader to block the square. Because, I mean, what's the big deal? You have uh, a green meeple trap for three points and a red meeple trap for four points. That's it, two meeples trapped and uh, no problem there. But of course, the Brazilian decides to go for the content. Let's see if that pays off or not. So Sanyu Blader starts a new city up top. Fukuda draws a shielded tile and starts well, um, the Brazilian does seem to like to just throw around his shielded tiles easily. Oh, uh, I should have read the chat. Um... Hi Lef, hi Vika, hi Melvin, you should be playing. Hi Victor, hi KRC Games, hi Mingo, hi Sergey. Excellent point Vika. So actually, Fukuda here could draw a city splitter like this, the one that Sani Blader just draw, and then separate himself from this ruin and potentially save this meeple. And this is why Fukuda actually didn't use either of these shielded towers to connect. He's basically waiting for the possibility to draw a splitter, it seems to me. Sandra Blader now with a meeple advantage, two open cities at, at the bottom left and uh, and up top. Fukuda still with two quite developed monasteries. And Sanyu Blader now makes an annoying move. 
which prevents Fukuda from completing this road easily. Now, instead of getting a curvy tile, uh, Fukuda will need a particular type of curvy tile, uh, mainly one of the seven remaining crossroads, which she now gets. Presumably going to meeple the city cap. Sandy Blader preemptively decided to meeple the field, given that it's already expanding. It has two completed cities on it. It's worth like six points. But then if this city gets completed, if this city gets completed, it's going to be worth 12 points. So certainly worth the meeple investment. According to the Argentinian, we see that Sandy Blader has disconnected. I think it's them, not me. But because I'm paranoid, I'm going to just refresh everything real quick. Yep, it's them, not me. Hopefully everything is all right with their connection. I need to remind you all that the rules of the tournament are really, really brutal. Oh, a brutal in terms of the time. So, like, why did I just suddenly pause and stop commentating? That was so silly. So, the, the idea is that if you go below zero even one second, then you lose entire, the entire game automatically, uh, according to the tournament rules. It doesn't matter if you were up ahead 50 points, you just lose the game. So, even if you disconnect and you have a bad internet connection, still a loss. Very brutal. Sandy Blader now with a simple curve, and both players are now thinking for longer. And this is a great time to remind you to meeple the like button. for the algorithm so that more people find out about this wonderful Copa America tournament and competitive Carcassonne in general. I don't know, this seems to be, he really seems to be thinking for a long time with this curve or it's just the internet connection. So hopefully Santiago's connection is uh, restored soon enough. He decides to protect his own city. So this is interesting. So he decided that there are more city caps with a piece of land remaining than there are city caps with a piece of field. No, yeah, with a piece of road. And so he decided to go over here. But I'm not normally a huge fan of such moves because even though they look like they defend something, they actually are quite restricting. So as... Uh, Fukuda also, I'm surprised. Actually, I'm not surprised. Well, no, no, I am surprised why Fukuda didn't choose to just take three points for the road. Apparently, they decided that they really, really need uh, the to create the threat of blocking this meeple. But now that I think about this, it's not really such a strong threat because let's say if um, red gets a curvy tile and puts it like this, then there still will be two dagger tiles like this that fit into this square. So it does seem like it's going to take a lot of effort to only slightly reduce the probability of completing this city. And it seems to me that these three points, especially in a tight position like this, was just not uh, it was just not worth the sacrifice. So you can see Fukuda now probably going over here. Yeah, exactly. But immediately Sandy Blader draws one of the dagger tiles. So all that effort was for nothing. Of course, it is a bit lucky that... Out of 36 tiles, he drew one of the two tiles that he needed immediately. But it's not that extraordinary. It happens sometimes. So that's why I'm not such a huge fan of investing so much time in blocking. But Fukuda does not get to complain as he completes a 10-point city, drops a 6-point farmer, and shares a 6-point droid. So the move, which I initially was skeptical about, ends up 
paying off the Brazilian big time and now he's two points ahead of the scoreboard and has two quite nice well-developed monasteries. Sani Blader does something interesting. I think Sani Blader's idea is to start blocking the square. You see, Fukuda chose to delay the connection to this city, hoping to draw a splitter tile and then free up this meeple. But as a result, the splitter tile still has not come, so this one point meeple is still stranded and technically not connected to the city, so. Santa Blader is trying to use that to his advantage. His idea is to go over here and then over here and to block the square completely so that this meeple doesn't get to escape and also that this meeple doesn't get to join the city as well. A move that we're probably going to see is something like this. Actually, I wonder why this move wasn't played before. So if he goes over here, this will make sure that a splitter is not even good. Oh, but he forgets about this idea. He simply chooses to meeple a road. And Fukuda breathes a huge, huge sigh of relief. Because uh, had they uh, attempted the block, this move, of course, would not have been possible. And Red now successfully connected to the ruin. So Red will not be able to save his meeple, but at the very least... This meeple will share the fate of this green meeple in scoring 10 points for a shared ruin. Sani Blade with a Dorito tile. Not the easiest decision, but I see some candidate moves. One would be to add over here and try to unify these two cities with the idea of reducing the total number of cities that are on Red's field. Another sneaky idea would be to go over here, slightly restrict Red's city, and then at the same time uh, to either finish a six-point city on his own or maybe even draw another Dorito and the last remaining giraffes next to connect to the big ruin all the way like this. And this would give like extra 15 points to Sand and Blader. So it's certainly something that's worth attempting. And also this would accomplish something important strategically if that were to work. But he chooses a different plan. He instead chooses a blocking move, sort of kind of blocking move against a Fukuda. I'm not a huge fan of this move, to be completely honest, because uh, so there's still one tile that fits into the square, which means it's not really a block. And uh, there is still one splitter, so Fukuda can get this meeple back anyway. But uh, a Sani Blader still is doing quite alright for themselves as they finish a city and drop a farmer. They st this, is f this farmer is only worth 3 points, but they can still draw a straight line and a vanilla city cap to connect into the farm like this. Now Santa Blader takes three points and makes it impossible for Fukuda to draw the splitter tile and free up the meeple. That was an important move, <laughs> but Santa Blader draws the splitter tile anyway, so uh, the Brazilian player would not have been able to free up this meeple in any case. And the situation looks really good for the Argentinian. Look at this, they have two meeples in hand, they control a nice nine-point field. Fukuda has meeple troubles over here, with this guy kind of almost being blocked. This guy also blocked but seven points that's not that bad and this guy seven points for the monastery versus four points for the road so that's a little bit red best for a red player a lot will depend on who 
uh, one whether Fukuda manages to finish this eight point city soon enough. So Sanyu Blader is definitely considering joining that city, but I like the fact that they chose not to do that. And look at what Fukuda's doing. Fukuda doesn't even care about the city anymore. He does not have illusions about finishing that city. He just decides to get um, eight quick points in his pocket as soon as possible. Does not meeple the field a second time, uh, possibly quite wisely so, because it's not easy to actually get into this field. Hi, Mono Maker. So, uh, triple crossroads with a city tile. What does Sandy Blader do with this? Decides to take two points for the road and at the same time create a blocking platform against this. I rather like it because it's not possible to defend. Normally, Fukuda could have been able to go over here and like pre build a four point road that goes through the city, but all the Dorito tiles here and here. Oh, wait, only four of the five Doritos tiles have been used up, which means that there's still one tile that enables him to do this. So, if you're Fukuda, probably you want to go over here and just pray that you're going to get one of these tiles. Well, the, la the one and only Dorito tile like this. Certainly seems worth the effort. And if you're feeling really desperate, which uh, I don't think they should, but for content they should, they could go over here and uh, drop a farmer even, trying to sneak in through the city all the way into this nine-point field. However, the Brazilian decides that the best defense is a counterattack, and their intention is to draw a T-shaped crossroads, place it over here in such a way that this guy will be trapped and that the green road meeple doesn't come out. Sanya Blader cannot do anything about it as um, he draws a tile that gives him a meeple back and also another farmer, so secure iron ironclad control of this 12-point field. It looks very, very dangerous. Because in addition to these extra 12 points that Green going to have at the end of the game for this field, there's also this city cab that could turn into a city. And this city cab that could turn into a city. So there are many, many threats which will be difficult to deal with for Fukuda. In the meantime, Fukuda made an interesting move over here. It seems like it is a restriction of this road. And 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Ah, so there's only one remaining curve remaining. So that's quite neat. So this meeple uh, will take a long time before it sees the light of day, if ever, ever. At the same time, Fukuda also managed to capitalize on not defending the square, as I suggested, because they were able to wait for a better tile, get a horse tile, as Brazilians call them, uh, score two points for the road and some extra points for the city as well. So now things are maybe not that bad for the Brazilian. Oh, that's a great uh, point. Yeah, so uh, there was indeed a four-point road option to score near the ruin, which probably I would have preferred, uh, but it is what it is. Well, I, there is definitely a lot, of, a lot to be said for having an extra city cap in your field. So, like, as Sani Blader, it might be wise to just go over here, or, like, over here. And maybe not even meeple this. Yeah, because look at this. If you go over here and just leave this alone, and if your opponent draws a city cap tile, well then they score f six points for the city, but they give your farmer three points here and your other farmer three points. So you're also scoring six points, but that's net zero. But if you go over here as green and then red doesn't draw a city cap and then you draw a city cap, then you score 12 points because you score both for the six point city and for the farmer twice. But now, Sandy Blader chooses to place a meeple in a slightly different way, and Fukuda manages to capitalize. So, the problem with um, Green's move here is not only that it left a city empty, I mean, leaving a city empty in your field is not such a big deal. It's like. Uh, this was what I was suggesting anyway, but the problem is that it also makes it so that Fukuda could decide to merge this three-point farmer 
with this uh, 15 point farmer together, basically negating the extra value that this farmer is providing. And normally with two, um, with fields that you control with two meeples, you want to be a little bit more flexible, but uh, Sanya Blader decides that uh, simply having a lot of cities on the field is enough. A lot of things happened while we were discussing this. these minutia. Sandy Blader scored 4 points for the road. This ruin is now actually kind of dangerous, so it is technically still possible for somebody to draw a city tile and then to reconquer this ruin in full. Maybe Sandy Blader wants to do that? Actually, why not do that? You can go here. Try and connect, and there's still two tiles remaining that, the remaining that fit into that square, I believe. For a fairly decent chance to do that, but there are also many other things that he could do. He could, for example, go over here and try to block this red city meeple, which is also next to red field and red monastery. And this actually sounds like something that would be useful. Honestly, I do think that breaking the city could be the best uh, move for Sani Blader. Otherwise, the threat is that a Fukura could draw a city cap and drop a farmer. And this is exactly what the Argentinian recognized one point difference on the scoreboard. Fukura now with a fat cow tile. Thinking where to put it. Decides to neutralize a city in his opponent's field. That makes sense. Sandy Blade with another cow tile. Well, surely now it's a bit too late to uh, to use to try and reconquer this ruin because uh, there are really only one tile remaining, the regular Dorito, that can be used for a connection. Actually, I missed it. No, there are no tiles anymore that fit into this square other than the, the one that Santi Blader actually has in hand. Or am I wrong? I am not wrong. Oh yeah, I wanted to move this. I know that for some of you it will be annoying, but some Brazilians have longer names. Looking at you, Mr. Young Talent. That's why we need to move the scoreboard. And some countries have longer names. That's why we can't really cut it down that much. Okay, let's leave it like this. And back to the game. Sandy Blader still thinking what to do with the Fat City piece. Doesn't seem to find any compelling option so far. Oh, Sandy Blader decides to attack the field. I love this. I think there's one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, there are two tiles that left it to fit into this square. So three point farmer and a very reasonable chance of reconnection. And he gets it. So uh, Fukura very quickly choose, chose not to negate the farmer, but instead simply rely on Sandy Blader not being able to connect. But Sandy Blader is able to connect. He's now going to go over here and get all the 12 points that were belonging to red. This is something that very often happens with farms, like you build them, build them, build them, and you can't use these meeples while you build them, and then your opponent, for most of the game, enjoys a meeple advantage, builds all kinds of monasteries, rows, and cities, and joins your field when you least wanted to capitalize on all the effort that you put into building this, and then what you're gonna do? Probably accept a loss. But wait, maybe we don't need to go there just yet because the Brazilians up five points on the scoreboard. 
And maybe Fukuda actually gonna go over here and re-attack this field. It seems quite likely to me that this is gonna happen. Or, instead Fukuda could just attack this field, because it's worth 18 points. Yeah, why settle for a 12-point field, but you can go for an 18-point field instead? He's thinking hard about this. Two minutes on the clock. Sandy Blader less than one minute on the clock, but it's not his turn. I'm going to try and figure out exactly... how far ahead Sandy Blader is. It's actually not that much because look at this. Red has seven, eight, that's 15 points for the monasteries, two points for the cities, that's 17, four points for the city, that's 21. Then green has three for the roads, that's 18. And then uh, 18, 21, 27 points for the roads. So that's actually nine extra points, I think for Sandy Blader on the board, and since Fukuda is five points uh, ahead on the scoreboard, Sandy Blader is at plus four, if I'm not mistaken. It's a surprisingly close game, because it seemed to me that Green really was crushing it. So, Umberto Fukuda facing a difficult decision needs to somehow get four points out of thin air. Easier said than done. It seems to me that the game will be decided by this remaining monastery tile because regardless whether it's a field attack or any other sort of use, this other remaining road monastery in the deck will give one of the parties a lot of points. The idea is this, for example, if Fukuda gets a road monastery, he could use the road monastery to connect to the bottom field for 12 points from here or to connect to the field on the right from here. However, I don't think I would do that and there are reasons for... Actually, no, I like it, I like it. I like this connection. Although, I don't think it actually impacts the winning chances that much because the idea is uh, we just need to get extra 4 points as, uh, as red. And whether we're getting extra 18 for the field or extra 12 for the field doesn't actually matter that much for the win as long as we have more points than our opponent. So Santa Blader, what do we do? Do we just try blindly hope that Red is not going to get the monastery with the road? Is there a way to reconnect into the field? Let's try and actually calculate this. So there are no curves remaining. I remember this. There are no... Ooh... There is this interesting tile remaining, I believe. So one of these guys, one of the city caps with the crossroads, one of the barbed wire tiles, and something, something, something else. This is not a vanilla city cap, so if you're thinking about going here and dropping a farmer, it's not really going to work. No straight lines remaining. I think there's a starting tile. I Ooh, and he chooses to try and finish a city. This is rather wise. But I think it's going to fall just... Oh, this is so smart. So, look at this. The idea is, like, if, if Fukuda goes over here, then either Sandy Blader draws the road monastery... with which he's able to reconnect to the field. Or, Sandy Blader draws the tile that, uh, the city cap tile that will enable him to finish the city. But I don't think the city will really be enough because Sandy Blader was up four points. Fukuda's gonna get 18 from the field. 
So that's like minus 14. And then this guy is going to get 8 points. And this is not going to be enough. So no matter what happens, the game will be decided. But the road monster on oh, the clock. 4, 3, 2, 1. Make a move, make a move, make a move. Umberto, no. A loss on time? Is that what's happening? That's so anticlimactic. Wait, or is it me? It could be me. No, my connection is alright. Well, Santa Blazer wins the monastery and wins the game anyway, but... Why is Fukuda not resigning? Can somebody from the tournament organizers, if we have anybody in uh, watching the stream, confirm if this is in fact in the rules, right? The, the party who goes... who loses on time has to concede the game. Well, obviously, Sandy Blader managed this, but, um, yeah, that's weird. It's going to be a close game. I believe the Argentinians should have it by a couple of points. By a couple of points. Wait, no? Wait, 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 wait. Okay, this is weird. Yeah, because look at this. I forgot when counting the points because Sandy Blader made a huge blunder on their last move. Sa okay, so now they're discussing this. Sa Sandy Blader made a huge blunder on the last move because they connected their second farmer into the field and this farmer who was scoring three points ended up scoring zero points because uh they're now this farmer is now not scoring twice for this city but only once and so then had mm, uh sandy blader played any other move than this he would have 105 points so two points ahead of Fukuda, but he's now saying in the chat that actually Fukuda should have resigned because he went out of time and now they're having this debate. Okay, this is spicy. Oh, so it's quite easy. Fukuda just said okay. So despite the fact that we see an extra point on this scoreboard for Fukuda, we can register that Sanya Blader actually is the one who won this game on time. Very unusual ending. And they are announcing a five minute break. So let's us actually watch somebody else. I want to watch Fugaza versus Gustavo Arruda because... Well, uh, Gustavo was a very strong player and we didn't him see him yesterday. And then if we have time, which we won't, because Melvin plays ex extremely fast, we can wa watch Melvin Quaresma versus Ale Rosario. So, wait, is that the first game or the second game? I think that's the... F oh, that's the second game. So, Gustavo won the first game against uh, Fugaza. And they're now in the middle of their second game. Very, very even. Two extra points on the scoreboard for Fugaza, who is playing the Black Meeples. Now two extra points on the scoreboard for Daruda, who is playing the Groot Meeples. Did I say Groot? Did I say Green? I meant Blue. Blue Meeples. Blue Meeples. Interesting situation. Many uses for the starting tile. Could go over here to free up his meeple. Or could go over here to add a boatload points to his road here at the expense of giving a couple of points to Black. To Black's little city. So he chooses to free up his own meeple. And I have to agree uh, with that assessment for now. 
meeples are valuable, especially in situations where there are some interesting field fights brewing, so there's this 12-point field uh, available up for grabs, which is now controlled by Aruda, but Fugaza is now trying to reconnect into it, and maybe somebody, for example, Fugaza or Aruda, could go over here, drop a farmer, try to connect through a curve, and take over the full 12 points for himself. But then there's, of course, the main field over here, which is now currently tied. One black meeple, one blue meeple. And that one has six completed cities on it for a healthy 18 points. In addition to the field, Fugaza has one blocked road meeple and one quite juicy looking city for like 11 points. So you have to prefer to play with the black meeples in this situation. Even though blue has the meeple advantage with 13 tall remaining, there's not a lot of time left to deploy these meeples properly. And Fugaza now just unashamedly dropped a second meeple, but in an even better place than I suggested, because look at this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So there's still two regular curves remaining that go into the square and one monastery with a road remaining that goes into the square. So three tiles still go into the square and this is quite a serious threat that with one tile, Black will be able to get two of his meeples into the field and take away these 12 points from Gustavo for himself. So this certainly would be a game decisive swing, which is why Gustavo drops a farmer. We're gonna see him drop a farmer. This is beautiful. The idea is that he can now use a road monastery for himself to connect all the farmers, or possibly he can put a tile over here, like a regular monastery, which still exists, that would enable him to connect his meeple like this. Beautiful, beautiful find here by Gustavo Aruda. By the way, I made a video about one of his field moves. Uh, it's, I think, was in the Move of the Week series from 2023. Number four or number five. Well, basically, go watch the entire playlist and uh, find it. Actually, I forgot who won the first game. I think it was Fugaza. But I have to update the scoreboard somehow. Well, anyway. Actually, I'm going to be... I'm going to check real quick. I'm too... No, it was actually Aruda. Okay, memory. Memory needs to be improved. Uh, anyway, anyway, anyway. So, two points are added by Fugaza over here. And uh, Gustavo is trying to create some sort of blocking platform. But this is also dangerous. Because if Fugaza gets any road style, which he doesn't. He could go over here, drop a third farmer, and just hope for yet another monastery to just take over all the fields in existence. However, he might have something else in mind. What if, as Fugaz, would you simply try to go over here and complete the city? And what are you going to do about it? That's the beauty of it. What are you going to do about it as, Dar as Aruda? He can't connect to the city he can only impede its development but that wouldn't would that be a complete block though well yes that would because this is the last city cap with the road remaining which is why he chooses not to do anything about this city but he chooses to attack the field in yet another fashion and also he chooses not to block this attacking point which i find quite interesting it's very interesting when you have a choice between blocking a field connection and uh, just making another field uh, and dropping yet another farmer. But Gustavo decides that he has so many meeples that it just uh, doesn't matter if he keeps dropping zero point farmer. So this one seems to pay off. We're probably going to see a connection into the field with this curve. Certainly a reasonable move for Gustavo, but maybe we're going to see some other surprises. Wait, there's still a vanilla city cap remaining that goes over here. So black could absolutely draw a city cap to finish this huge city. Which is why they try and prevent black from doing that. Black didn't have a city cap in hand. Black had something else in hand. 
probably a move that is worth considering is like going over here, trying to ruin all kinds of uh, road monastery opportunities. Just uh, the just limits blues options for field connections. Well, Fugazi chose a different move. I'm not sure if that would have mattered or not. Or I guess the move was an attempt to block a six-point city over here so that none of the sides have it. Aruda was able to connect to the farm using the last curve remaining. So there are now no curves remaining, which means now Fugazi really needs a road monastery over here to have a little field for himself. And actually, this is totally going to work. Even though... Gustavo Aruda can enjoy the big field for 18 points. If Fugaza gets a small 12-point field, this should be enough to win because uh, this ruin has more than enough points to offset the point difference between these two fields. So again, we might see yet another game decided by a road monastery that's like such a Carcassonne classic. Because if you think about this, how you play, like from Fugaza's perspective, how do you win this game without a road monastery? And I think the real answer is you don't. You just need to hope for it. Hope for the best. Still, this requires some precise moves. I actually don't have a good suggestion what to do here as black. The best that I can come up with is discarding this monastery. There are... Wait! <laughs> There are no tiles that fit into this square, so self-blocking the city was not necessary. Darude gets a row tile and chooses to meet with like this. This is kind of fun. I mean, Fugaza can't really do much. It's going to be a coin flip between, between this and another tile. But wait, Fugaza can do something, actually. Why don't we... Ah, well, Gustavo draws the road monastery. But I was thinking that um, Fugazi could have gone over here and tried to get another farmer. But it really doesn't matter. It's all about who's going to get that road monastery. And even though the Argentinian prevented the most painful move from happening, this farmer will now not get into the main field and all these fields will not be unified. Still, the um, Brazilian will have enough field points to confidently outscore this ruin and then some this 18 point field for blue and this 12 point field also for blue so it's quite unfortunate that this i'd say brilliant farmer which was relying on three tiles so a very high chance of connecting uh black ended up drawing none of the three tiles which happens like only once every nine games at that point of the game so it's uh Quite the day for Gustavo and Team Brazil, and it looks like Brazil is getting their first match point as the player with the blue meeples gets more and more and more points added to his tally. Plus 19. And we congratulate Gustavo and Team Brazil for getting on the match scoreboard.
but let's continue on. We haven't looked that much at Melvin's game with the screen and car. They won the first game against uh, Ale Rosario of Argentina and they're nearing the approach of the second. So the Argentinian, very high rated, 600. Uh, Melvin Quaresma, of course, uh, a, a master and 717 is actually more closer to their lower range of their normal rating. So, and despite all their high rating, it looks like this game is not going quite great for the Brazil for the Brazil Brazilian player with the red meeple, I think. But I may be mistaken. Because the first thing that I look at is oh the Argentinian has so many meeples, but he has one fewer points on the scoreboard. And this monastery is nice, but this red monastery is a little bit better. This city shared. This city will be shared eventually. Well, this six-point road is nice, but all I'm seeing on the board with 15 tiles remaining is just loads of red farmers. And re these red farmers score a substantial number of points, which is why <laughs> Alejandro decides to forget about the fields and find happiness elsewhere. And look at this. The one tile that he can use for 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 fighting for the city he gets and now the one tile that he can use to connect to a city well three four five six seven yeah okay one of the two tiles that were available to accomplish this connection he also gets instantly and as a cherry on top he also gets a monastery of evil back but i wonder why he didn't drop a farmer because that would have been super useful like he has three meeples remaining and the point of this farmer is that it sort of kind of creates the threat that you're going to engage in a field fight and if you were to drop a farmer the idea is that if um if uh melvin were to draw the last remaining ah uh, no 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 i was going to say that like if red were to draw some sort of city tile that fit into the square if red wanted to re-attack uh, the city then this would have automatically put green farmer into the field the problem is that there are actually no tiles remaining uh, that can be used to attack the city from this square actually it's like very hard to re-attack the city which is why Ka is creating an opportunity to re-attack the city simply w spending an entire move just on creating an attacking platform R Rosario now being a bit quite greedy, uh, not not greedy, but stingy, deciding to just get a meeple back instead of taking uh, four, uh, four quick points. Uh, this allows Ka to take four quick points, which he's super happy with. And now probably from a Brazilian will need to see an important decision. This ruin belongs to the play with the green meeples and it's worth 13 points, which is quite a lot of points, which is only five points less than this uh, big field over here. This big field is worth 18. So that's, but I wonder why Cod doesn't even bother attacking it. Okay, the big field's worth 21. And this farmer also scores three. I need to think about this. Okay, let's actually have a look. So eight points for the monastery, four red, five points for, ro for the road, four. Um, green that's three points net for red then uh minus 13 points at minus 10 for red plus 21 for the farmers that's plus 11 for red which means that kai is currently minus three points and and, and minus two meeples it does not look good for the brazilian unless he can draw some sort of city cap that can give him quick seven points but he can't because it is the argentinian who has the city cap and the Argentinian scores extra four points, so seven point difference, I believe. And now between the two players, the Brazilian must find something. He decides to at least expand his field. Certainly a very noble effort. If he gets another row tile, then this little city piece will belong into the main field, uh, adding the total tally of cities to eight, making it 24 points. I think I may have miscounted a city or something. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 
Oh yeah, I might have... No, no, I, I counted the main field correct. I just forgot to add this. So I believe that now Ka is behind four points instead of seven. Something like this. But anyway, the point is the game is close, but uh, the Argentinian has more meeples. This is what you need to know about this. And Melvin is now really trying to make some meepleless moves that give him at least some number of points. Huh, this is interesting. Look at this lovely move. So, Rosario decides to sacrifice a couple of points and then make a two-point move. One point for the city, one point for the road, simply to prevent Melvin from having a platform for invading the city. Now, it's not possible to attack the city, but now that I think about this, I don't think it was possible to attack it anyway. Because this is the last triple city tile and there were no Doritos remaining. So it wasn't actually possible to connect to the city. I think it's a miss by the Argentinian player. Melvin now scoring four points for the city at the bottom, which I think puts him still behind one point. Something like this, something like this. Rosario still has two meeples. The natural move is to go over here and uh, drop a farmer for six points. And this is what's going to happen. Ka now gets a road tile. Presumably, he's going to go over here, score five points, gets a field expansion. But this will be just short as Rosario draws another quick point tile, which will give him three points something like that just many many ways to score three points and of course Melvin would have won had there been more tile in the deck if red only gets this one and just goes like like this a little bit to extend this road so that this Six point meeple gets eaten up by these two menacing looking red farmers. But it's not going to happen because Rosario has the last tile. Thinking very hard what to do with it. I don't think it matters that much. Still gotta use all the time, gotta use that clock. Oh, uh, I actually only now noticed, no, it does matter. Like, there's only one move over here, four points for the road. For some reason, I missed this. Or an alternative is to go over here, get one point for the city and three po points for this little farm. So depending on your taste, many, uh, well, two different ways here you can get four points. While the player is thinking, we don't need to worry it anymore. I was going to say that he got himself down under one minute, but this is enough time to click the button without having your hand shaking or everything. I remember in my first game I lost on time, basically, or was close to losing on time because, like, I was so nervous I couldn't just click the mouse button properly. This is certainly not the case, as the Argentinian captain, or former captain, I don't remember, uh, the experienced player is very composed. And look at this, a boatload of field points for a car, but just not enough. All because of the courageous decision and this tall sequence that allowed the Argentinian to conquer a huge ruin. So 13 rating points and 1 game points down for Ka, still above the master threshold, not that it matters that much, it matters to some for some reason, and we're going to view their decider in just a second after I update the score.
and I check real quick on Fukuda. So they're still playing the second game. That is interesting. Oh, look at this. They were playing a practice game 12 years ago. Interesting how uh, Fukuda didn't play any games for 12 days. So maybe that's why they lost of times. Lack of practice. Gotta practice. Gotta watch this channel permanently to keep your levels up. So this game started a long time ago. 12, 12 tiles until the end. Very, very even. I'm actually going to open several positions now. I just want to open Ka again because it's nice to view a decider straight from the start. And we will be looking... Yeah, we'll be just waiting until uh, Ka starts against Rosario. No, 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 not like that. Alrighty. Yes, thank you, Lef Ivana, for pointing that out. I was... It took me a bit too long to find the road move. Now that, now that I see your chat, I think I forgot to remove the one minute delay from the stream. So yeah, you're hearing past me, just so you know. It, there's a one minute delay added on purpose. So I will be responding to your messages. I will be just doing that a little bit later. Let's make sense of this position. Sani Blader now makes it harder for Fukuda to finish his own city. But Fukuda doesn't care that much about cities. He cares much about fields. Because there are some field fights going on. So. Look at this red farmer. This red farmer is feeding 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 cities for 18 points. Whereas this green farmer, which was trying to join, was earlier denied over here. So only six points for this little guy. So that's a net 12 points advantage for Sandy Blader. Then Sandy Blader also has the better road. Six points over here versus three points for Fukuda. This is an extra 15 point advantage. Then the monasteries are the same. Six for red, six for green. And then this little three point city for green, which is kind of annoying and wow. Sandy Blader doesn't even mind continuing the city of his opponents, if only this means preserving the majority on the field. Currently, uh, overall, if we count the points on the board, I think red is like plus nine ahead. Because this guy is scoring 3 points, we should remember that. Plus 9? Yeah, plus 9. Uh, but also, red is 5 points behind, which means that red is only 4 points ahead. Actually, a very similar situation to what we had in the first game. Thank you, Aladdin, for confirming that Chile won 3 uh, versus 1 against Mexico. So we will have a brief look at that other match. We'll have a look at how the duels unfolded. I will update the score accordingly. Okay, let's see if actually Melvin started playing in the meantime. Yeah, they have. Three minutes ago.
and that decider seems to be going in an interesting way so we're starting with a closed position as the Argentinian player with the green meeples will going to find some difficulties getting this meeple back and so far he doesn't really have that much to show for it but also he has the first monastery so that's a slight advantage but on the other hand Ka has six meeples in hand and four points on the scoreboard so that's a slight advantage the position is relatively even as Ka gets more points on the scoreboards I actually am not a huge fan of this move I mean it, nah, I don't know um well, it has ups and uh, it has upsides and downsides. So the upside is, of course, eliminating a dangerous city cap next to your opponent's monastery. But the downside is that red basically is giving up on the idea of blocking this meeple or blocking this meeple because this square is actually reasonably safe. The Argentinian continues the city at the bottom. The Brazilian tries to attack, and now we're going to see an interesting decision here by Ale Rosario, either to go over here over here over here well really it's either this spot or this spot so which one's more vulnerable the argentinian needs to decide i know what i would have done i would have done the other thing but that's why i'm not playing in this tournament in the meantime there's some developments in the field fight that we see at the bottom we see how Sani Blazer drew a city cap that allowed him to join into the field again and, and control the field completely basically with these two extra meeples and we see that now Fukuda went full desperation mode I'm not quite sure what this farmer is look at this over here is that a misclick oh no it's not a misclick it's an attempt to get a curve and go like this oh that's lovely is that still doable uh one two three four five six seven eight yes there is one curve remaining still one two three four five six seven eight okay we're watching this one full screen forget about the other game for a second But now that I think about this, I don't think that's going to even matter because... No, it will matter. I think it's for the game. I'm not sure necessarily because the other development that happened is that a red managed to deploy his one meeple for a lovely five-point road. On the other hand, notice this little shielded piece. And this is something that I missed, that green has actually one extra point compared to this little city piece by red which does not have a shield on it so this little stuff it adds up but Sandra Blair now gets four quick points for the city and he will also have a meeple to play after this so it does seem that the Argentinian will have an edge but it doesn't matter because the Fukuda doesn't draw the tile that he needs anyway look at this the curve which would have given Fukuda access to the field belongs to Sani Blader, who will unashamedly use it for a five-point road. So let's actually check. So the field was 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 18 points, uh, and Fukuda used this tile for a city. So Fukuda would have had 17 more points had he drawn the tile that he needed. But let's have a look if that actually even would have mattered. Oh, it would have mattered, it seems to me. It totally would have mattered. So the game came down to a coin flip again. And Sandy Blader won the coin flip again. This is how you defeat Brazilian masters. Big field fights win coin flips. But, I mean, in order to win the coin flip, of course, Sandy Blader had to put himself into a good position to have that scoreboard lead in the first place. So, congratulations to Sandy Blader and Team Argentina who get themselves on the scoreboard. So, back to this. Well, uh, very, very tight game here as both players have four meeples in hand and 18 points 
green versus red, the nightmare of around 5% of the male population. I, mean, I think it's less. No. 4%, but like... Uh, I think that the default colors are ridiculous for Board Game Arena. Especially that green is one of the default colors. Like, green is just so hard to spot on the on the field. That's why many world champions and many like super strong players choose green, but not Melvin Karajma. So massive respect for choosing another color which is not green. Also, as some of you know, green is illegal at the world championship, sort of, kind of. At the world championship in person, you're not allowed to use green when playing on the streamed table because it messes with the viewers. Hi, Edgar. Thanks for confirming, Aladan, that Chile won for four versus one. Well, dominant performance, Chile hasn't lost to anybody. When we just started, I was calling it that Chile uh, is one of the two top teams that I view as contenders for the title. The other team, in my view, is Brazil. Rosario now thinking, let's make a bit of more sense for this position. Anyway, enough ranting about Meeple Colors. More about the game. Really thinking a lot with the city cap. So, I mean, he could finish the city, which is an intuitive move, which I would do. But he chooses not to. He chooses to Meeple a farm, and I rather like it. It's rather creative. He wants to make sure that... When Melvin finishes this city over here, then this farmer will already be scoring 9 points. But, uh, I, I mean, it makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. So Ka now decides to clean off the city cap. No fear for the safety of this meeple. We're probably going to see a quick punishment by Rosario. But the whole point of this was just simply to try and clean off as many city, cap as pos as many city caps as possible. Ka, now look at this, look at this, look at this. Okay, let's see if he does this. He has an option to go over here and finish the city, but I think instead he didn't go over here and meeple the road, but I would have preferred a slightly different move, maybe like one tile to the left and just take the three points for the road. Uh, anyway, it's just a matter of taste, but I definitely like the idea of taking the advantage of both the city cap component and the road component of the tile. And also, I like the idea of being eight points ahead on the scoreboard. It's definitely a bit easier to win that way when you are ahead on the scoreboard. Rosario with a city cap tile. Finishes the city. Melvin starts a new road next to the monastery, or will he use this tile as a field tile instead? This is also totally doable. I think that the road is slightly preferable, more preferable, because there's always the threat that green could draw the tile that fit into the square and then meeple the road. So actually, as green, why don't we go over here and meeple the road anyway? Hoping to get this tile and then connect the road together with the city because if you think about this now on some level red needs this tile more than green because two of red's meeples are tied together to the square whereas one green meeple is tied to the square so it's even in green's interest to stay put and not put this tile over here so if red's gonna put this tile over here eventually as green we might as well anticipate that and Meeple the road like this. Also, pre-building a monastery spot next to your monastery looks like a killer move if you ask me. But the problem with that is that you will be foregoing the temporary meeple advantage. Uh, another problem is that there's still a lovely move that can be played over here, trying to build a five-point road like this, or like some sort of farmer move here or here maybe putting some pressure on this square is absolutely possible. So there's a wealth of choices. Like, spatially, honestly, this looks like 
Mwah. But uh, the Argentinian might have some other ideas, and instead he chooses to use this tile as a simple blocking tile. Melvin gets the tile that gives him a meeple back and four points. Well, Rosario now has another curve. What can he do? Still, the five point road has always been an option. This move is always an option. But I have a feeling that instead he might choose to go over here and try to put further pressure on the square. Like, if you start blocking something, you continue blocking something. Especially given the fact that one, two, three, all the three triple city tiles with the road have gone out. So let's say if we get this tile, we put it over here with the fields side facing leftwards, then we get something like this or any sort of city tile, put it like this, and then this meeple will be permanently trapped with just three points. So maybe that's the plan of Ale. However, however, he cho chooses a different blocking approach which I actually genuinely think is a mistake. Ka draws a defense and look at this beauty. And drops a farmer, like the efficiency of this player. And he's not even gonna bother connecting from here. He's gonna wait until he's gonna draw the last remaining starting tile or one of the two remaining city cap for the crossroads, finish his city and then go over here. Now another dangerous move here by Melvin. He's trying to equalize this city cap. That is strong. Rosario getting a tile that is the mirror image of the critical tile for this square. What does he do with it? I still like five point roads, if I'm honest. Uh, he could go over here, put some pressure on this square. I'm not sure what else he could do. Uh, hi, Sandy Blader, congratulations on your win, and thanks uh, together with KRC Games confirming that it is 2 versus 2 Brazil versus Argentina. I will update the score shortly, but this means that we're watching the decider for the entire match. I hopefully, hopefully both players have anxiety levels rising accordingly. Anxiety means more mistakes, which means that more fun carcass on move to discuss and criticize. Just kidding, I hope that both players give it their best responsibility this should be scary well anyway rosario tries to block melvin's city and melvin immediately draws a defense and now creates a, a a hole next to his city in the shape of this tile that rosario just drew but brazilian fans don't panic just yet there's still one more tile like this in the deck and one tile only and i think that if red draws this, it should be enough to win, given that they have an 8-point lead on the scoreboard. But Rosario doesn't care. Maybe he wants to win with a big field, and this is could also totally work. Because look at this. 1-2, 3-4, maybe later 5. That's like 15 potential field points. This is not nothing. Rosario taking two quick points for the road. I think prematurely they should have taken three points up top instead. I will keep saying this, that uh, crossroads are valuable, especially when you're behind on the scoreboard. Melvin now needs to decide how are they going to win the game. Are they going to fight for the field or will they try to just score points elsewhere? Can't really do much with this tile. can't really start a new city because you need your meeples, right? You first of all need to get your meeple back from here and then ideally you want to need to get something from here Well, you're going to need to get that tile that Rosario just got which he's not going to put over here. Rosario is probably going to do like something like this, drop a tile next to their farm or in their farm rather trying to gain more field points. And yeah, Melvin really, really needs this. So there's one more tile remaining like this that goes into the square. And there's one more tile remaining like this that goes into the square. And without any without any of those tiles, I'm not sure if I, I see a path to victory here for the red, play with the red meeples. Maybe I am being a bit too pessimistic from the Brazilian perspective because 
I forgot this beautiful 7 point road which actually is currently outscoring the 6 point farmer. In the future the 6 point farmer might be even forced to merge with the main field meaning that the extra 6 points for these two cities will be negated and actually then I think Red is doing quite well for himself even with this trap meeple and this trap meeple. This provided if Red manages to complete the, the city connection over here and if Red manages to get his meeple back from the road soon enough. Isna is bringing an excellent point. They fight hard for the bottom field, but they don't see the potential 9-point field on top. Well, yes they do. Melvin now drops a 9-point farmer on the counter field. And it's a boatload of points. And again, Rosario was not able, as I was suggesting before, did not manage to equalize that road on time. And all of these beautiful road points now belong to Melvin and Melvin only. Patience pays off, the critical tile has been drawn, and this 9-point field, this 9-point farmer alone is scoring almost as much as these three farmers combined. Well, when this guy merges into this field, there will be only 4 completed cities on the field worth 12 points. This is 12 points per meeple, which is really not a lot. Rosario decides that he really, really needs meeples not meeples but points and chooses to invest his last meeple into the monastery with some concessions now if he wants to get a meeple back he's kind of forced to go over here and secure melvin's road and this is exactly what he does he just figures that he really needs meeples back melvin tries to create a blocking platform against uh, Rosario's city. The Argentinian does not draw a defense tile. Well, they actually, they might go over here trying to make this guy harder to block, but instead they choose to make, to get themselves a full point. And also to put some pressure on this square, but in the meantime, Melvin draws a huge tile, one that gives him four points for the road and an opportunity to connect to the city and that was his plan all along so that was actually the purpose of this road meeple like 30 moves ago to find the tile exactly like this and now he's threatening not only to equalize but to take this city over completely and there are four tiles still remaining in the game that fits into the square which means that Rosario will need to urgently do something about this. Well, the first thing that he does about this is he draws one of the tiles that fits into this square. So that's a good start. But what exactly do you do with this? Do you go over here, drop your farmer, uh, drop your last meeple and attack the nine point field? You could. Do you go over here, continue a monastery, get one point? You could. Do you go over here and start some sort of blocking attack? You could. Plenty of options here for the Argentinian and only uh, less than one and a half minutes on the clock. Let's see how he manages to find a productive move in this time. In the meantime, I forgot to mention that uh, Ale found a move that blocks the road of Melvin because there are no starting tiles, so no star tiles remaining that fit into this square. However, honestly, I think this red meeple doesn't care if your road is worth 11 points it's a road worth staying on forever the argentinian now reveals his plan as he adds one point next to his monastery and his plan is to draw all four of the tile that fit into this square this would actually enable him to win the game yes maybe because Melvin now got 4 points for the road, 8 points for the city, got a meeple back, and plus 18 on the scoreboard is no joke, but Rosario now draws a fantastic tile that gives him a meeple back from the monastery and possibly even a new city. I would probably meeple the city, you just have to meeple everything at this point. Not least so that you prevent red from meepling a city like this. Think fantastic tile, goes over here. 
a hole so nicely pre-built here by the play with the green meeples. Time to capitalize on all these meticulous calculations. Rosario still thinking, maybe he has a better idea than finishing this monastery? I don't think so, I think his idea is really... Wait! There is another crazy idea! We could actually, like, go over here, even? Or over here! And meeple it like this, because there are still two more Doritos remaining. And then you hope to draw the Dorito on the next move, then a triple city, then a Dorito, something like this. So this is also, this is not crazy. But he decides not to meeple this. Well, maybe under time pressure, on the 10 seconds on the clock. Melvin will meeple this in a heartbeat. And that's why you never leave this type of city alone. So you see, because Rosario didn't manage to meeple this, he now couldn't spend a tile attacking... Well, actually, he, he should have attacked the city, I think. But I'm so surprised that the Argentinian it was... Such a great way to try to come back into this game. Okay, this one. We go over here, block the city, and drop a farmer. If something's going to win this for Argentina, it moves like this. We have to be very bold and precise. And it's a double-purpose move because there's still two regular Doritos. So you go over here. You take away the opportunity to finish the city with one of the two, with one of the two regular Doritos. There's and you leave your opponents and then later on you actually can use one of these two regular Doritos to connect to this field from here. Farmer like this, whoop, sneaking in, sharing these nine points. This is the plan for Team Argentina. This is how the play with the Green Meeples should, I think, follow through. Maybe they see something else that I don't that I don't, but still. Red is having a threat of completing the city. It's just too, too, too severe. We need to do something about this, but he chooses not to. He does drop a farmer, but from a different place. Well, Ka draws the Dorito tile anyway, but had he put this tile over here, then at the very least, at the very least, uh, Melvin would not have been able to drop a farmer because now there is uh, some sort of possible situation how this guy connects through a Dorito, then Melvin gets another Dorito and then a straight line and then reconnect as well. Wow, this is something else. What a farmer here from Rosario. I mean, he must know something about the tile counts that I don't. Maybe he just wants to prevent this guy from getting into the field too easily with a straight line. And I certainly, I can understand this, but this is something else. Okay, so this tile obviously needs to go here because... Uh, Green actually fulfilled his part of the plan by drawing all the four triple city tiles that fit into the square. So Green manages to successfully connect to the field. And Rosario manages to reconnect so the field will be tied. But who wins? This is the question. It's going to be incredibly close. 
because these two guys for four points did not manage to join the big ruin. Um, Rosario had the field over here for a lot of points, but Melvin had the road and the scoreboard lead. It's going to be super, super close, I think. Don't tell me, don't refresh. Scoring fields now. Four points for the last move road by Melvin. But a beautiful ruin for Rosario. 12 points shared field. And I believe the field at the bottom for 18 points is not going to be enough. Six points win for Melvin Quaresma. And a minimum advantage win for Brazil. Three versus two. We congratulate Brazil who makes their way into the semifinals. And uh, Argentina, of course, great performance, coming so close uh, and managing to qualify out of a tough group. And we'll see Argentina in half an hour in the game, in their bronze medal game against Mexico. Argentina won against Mexico uh, earlier on. They will be looking to get their revenge but i want to check real quick how the other two games went i mean i've already got the info that it's 1-1 but let's see exactly who uh exactly what the score was so teos Teos 1-2 versus 0, and then Lord Trooper won against the newcomer also 2-0. So, very symmetrical results. Actually, interestingly, all the uh, duels ended up being 2 versus 0, except the one that we just saw with uh, the spectacular decider. But uh, I, f I felt like the Brazilian player deserved it. I mean... Ari Rosari was very creative, but all these threats, like that city on the left, that city at the top, that counterfield in the middle, thats it just all ties together, and the way Melvin plays just always keeps their opponent on their feet, and unless you're like hyper vigilant, or unless you have counter threat on your own, it's very difficult to deal with that style of play, which we just seen uh, the proof of. My commiserations to my Argentinian fans, uh, but still give it your best in the bronze medal game. I think we're going to have a little break. Wait, let me actually update the score properly. So Brazil 3, Argentina 2, Chile 4, Mexico 1. So I will see you five minutes before the bronze medal match. It starts at 1800 UTC. So at 1755, we're going to do a little bit of uh, pre-match banter. Uh, before you leave, just need to remind you to meeple the like button unless you already have to. Subscribe to the channel unless you already have to. And uh, if you feel especially in a good mood today, then I've enabled the super thanks button for those of you who want to show extra appreciation that would also be super super helpful for this channel alrighty see y'all in 23 minutes
I wish good things to you who is still watching this. I'm still Alexi and we back in the stream of our final matches of Copa America at tournament in which nine teams were set out to find out who the strongest team in the Western Hemisphere is and we're now have only two matches remaining in the tournament. Oh, thank you Edgar for 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 confirming that Brazil versus Chile final has been moved later. So we will have now all the time in the world to enjoy and focus on the bronze medal match between Argentina and Mexico. For those of you who just joining, I will remind you that Argentina very narrowly lost two versus three against uh, their semifinal with Brazil, whereas Mexico uh, had a cold shower, losing one uh, against four against the unstoppable force of Chile. And now Argentina and Mexico will face it again after they already uh, they faced each other in the preliminary rounds uh, yesterday because they were in the same group in the group stage and Argentina prevailed I believe 4-1 at that time so now Mexico will be looking for a rematch also I just realized that I need to update not just the names but the actual scores as well and I'm thinking that now let's have a look at um, out of these matchups uh, close uh, uh, so Santi Blader Complex V and H will be close and Hurt You Minor Rory will be super close and interesting. But I want to have a look at table number five. Uh, Lord Trooper versus Daniel Ayala 94. We have already looked at one uh, Daniel's games, but Lord uh, Tropper Tropper? Hmm. I thought it was Trooper. Okay, interesting. I just I realized that I kept misreading that screen name all the time. They have actually been quite strong for Argentina and delivering points in uh, important moments so and also I have their page open anyway hmm that's interesting sometimes board game arena does this wants to prevent us from seeing more Carcassonne. Okay. Is that a sign? Yeah, it was just... Uh, oh no! It was actually Lord Trooper. It's just in misspelled on my scoreboard. But I have a defense. I copied it from somewhere else. So, both players playing pretty quickly as the game started a minute ago, but only 62 tiles remaining. Daniel Ayala, uh, the experienced Mexican player who used to be the United States champion because they reside in the United States. Uh, that was two years ago. They're representing Team Mexico and the Blue Meeples. Uh, whereas Lord Trooper of Argentina has the correct preference of Yellow Meeples. And in addition to the yellow meeples, they also have three points on the scoreboard as they finish a road and start a new city cap. Daniel has uh, a bunch of city caps open going for him. I assume that soon we will see one of the cities being completed. Or if you want to get cute, yeah, you could do something like this. And I rather like it, kind of trying to attack the city, hoping to maybe uh, prevent it uh, from completion. And this move does indeed put some substantial pressure on Lord Trooper Square. Lord Trooper doesn't draw a good defense tile, but instead starts a new city up top. Daniel does not draw a, a good attacking tile, so this square is still up in the air, but where exactly is going to use a straight line? Beautiful move, both harassing this little city piece and at the same time protecting this guy at the bottom slightly. So always a double purpose move is welcome. The yellow player has three good choices. Uh, we can go over here. Yeah, I really like this move, trying to defend this square and also at the same time putting pressure on this square over here. Now Daniel has loads, loads of choices, like we could finish any of these three cities, for example, or what I prefer better is finish none of these cities, but go over here, score two points and point the city cap left toward. Nope, nope, not like that. 
there's still 10 Dolito tiles in the deck and the idea was that we could have scored two points and set up a triangle city piece. So honestly, I think my suggestion was just better. But uh, who knows, you know, I'm not the one who has to experience the anxiety of playing in such an important match. Uh, and um, in some scenarios, if you implement my suggestion, then this Meeples gets lost. Oh, but in this scenario, of course, the next tile by Daniel Dayala is a Dorito, and uh, this thing over here that I was suggesting would have totally worked. But yeah, it's, it's interesting sometimes that if you have multiple cities open, sometimes the most lucrative move is closing none of these three cities. But just to double down and set up good tiles and then capitalize on the efficient building... Um, in the maximum possible way. Daniel now has an interesting choice. I mean, he does have uh, 12 points on the scoreboard. There's no point in uh, attacking this square, really, because it's not possible to restrict it substantially, or at least uh, to lower the probability of Lord Trooper getting his meeples back enough that it would be worth doing. And that's why I'm not a huge fan of this move. A move that I preferred instead was going over here, dropping a farmer, and then trying to block these two cities. The, f uh, the fate of these two yellow meeple is tied together because both of the splitter tiles have been already used up, so there's no way how these two can separate. So either yellow is going to finish a medium-sized city, or yellow is going to stay without two meeples for the rest of the game. It's uh, either... It's between with the two extremes. Well, well, well. Lord Trooper does draw the tile that they needed soon enough. Again, that was quite predictable. I wouldn't call that a particular stroke of luck. Uh, so... And now, actually, if you are the Argentinian, I would... Well, I mean, you could go over here, but actually I wouldn't touch this. Well, yeah, sure. Makes sense, makes sense, makes sense. Uh, I would even drop a farmer there, maybe. I love dropping farmers, like, especially... Look, no, actually, you know, I, let's, let's think about this. Two cities over here. When this city is going to get completed, or when somebody puts a tile over here, it's going to be three uh, cities in the farm, so that's already worth investing a meeple. Then this guy also probably going to finish uh, this city soon, so that's already, like, four. And, uh, yeah, this is looking to be a very, very lucrative field. Lord Trooper gets a beautiful crossroad toss for 4 points, now 11 points on the scoreboard, 3 points behind the, um, I was going to say the American, but I meant to say the Mexican, although I really meant to say both. Now, beautiful move for Daniel, trying to start a 3-point road, uh, but all, uh, which it was now going to turn into a 4-point road, and now I would also meeple that farm, and I... Oh, he doesn't even finish that word, he actually wants to... Hmm, that's interesting. So he wants to wait until uh, for for a future tile to get this meeple back. But first, he wants to create a platform for blocking the city because the city is getting quite dangerous. As Lord drew a tile that protects uh, one of the city squares. And the idea here is that there's still four tiles remaining that left into this square, three tiles that remaining that left into this square. So all pretty good odds of completing the city. Now, Mr. Lord here, I think, should finish their city because this square next to their city is really vulnerable. But if we finish the city, we just make sure that this meeple is not tangled together with this. Uh, so chooses not to do that. And Daniel Yala sacrifices points, decides not to take three quick points for the road, but just so that they can put a thorn into the square as soon as possible. Honestly, maybe I even agree. There are now 11 points ahead on the scoreboard, and if they can only block all these meeples, then I think uh, Blue is going to do quite well. Well, Daniel draws another crossroads anyway, so he will have a chance to score quick points nonetheless. Dilemma, though. Could go here, score three points, that's the maximum number, but this harasses the city. Could score three points over here, but this also sort of kind of blocks the city. 
could score two points over here, create uh, preparing to create a, a full block. But the downside of that move is that it allows Lord Trooper passive defense. So let's say if the yellow player draws a city cap like this, puts it over here, then um, this will basically allow Lord Trooper to escape from this situation at the same time protecting this square. And look at the tile draw. So Daniel decides to roll the dice. And Lord does not draw a, um, well, he draws actually a very good tile, but not a very good tile for defending this square. Uh, and he doesn't draw a city cap for getting the city back. So the situation is still up in the air. Again, does not draw a good tile. Well, what's going to happen there? I'm so curious. One, two, three, four, five. Ooh. So there are one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so there's two straight lines remaining. And an option that Lord Trooper could do is go over here and have two tiles remaining to finish the monastery and maybe even drop a farmer i i just keep uh, assuming that south american players are going to drop farmers left and right do it do it okay he chose not to do that which honestly makes sense Alrighty. daniel makes a very good move i think he prevents lord from finishing this city and make sure that the fate of this poor meeple is tied together with the fate of this richer meeple. Ah, uh, unfortunately for the Argentinian. Uh, he spends a city cap trying to protect this square, but immediately, immediately Daniel draws the one tile that the yellow player needed over here, meaning that this square is permanently blocked. These two meeples are now deceased. And just to rub it in, the blue player still has two tiles that go over here and give him a meeple back. And then the yellow will have two meeples trapped over here. But that's not all. Just to rub it in, in order to make this defense, and I do think that was a mistake here by the Argentinian, he uh, compromised the security of this meeple. It just looks... Like, it's a block waiting to happen. But not yet, as Daniel does not draw a good blocking tile, but what is... Yeah? Why not just go over here? I don't get this. Well, okay, I think I do understand this. So his idea was... Actually, that's a really neat idea. I, I like the move that Lord Trooper just played. So, at the expense of the security of this meeple, he basically blocked the entry of this blue farmer into this field... So this means that if this blue farmer wants all the field points, blue will be forced to place a straight line over here in such a way uh, that completes yellow's monastery. So that was the idea behind this move. But look at this. By trying to overprotect his meeples, Lord Trooper got more of his meeples trapped, which is very often the paradox of Carcassonne. Uh, yes, so instead of saving this meeple earlier, uh, Lord tried to save the big city, but now he loses that meeple as Daniel Ayala puts a thorn into the square, forever trapped with one point, and it has to be painful. Okay, so Lord Trooper actually has no choice uh, but, but drop a farmer. I know it's a bit counterintuitive, but this field is so important, it's like nine points, it's quite... I know it's unpleasant to play the entirety of the game of just one meeple, but it's something that just has to be done. Daniel Ayala will probably finish the city and drop a farmer, preparing to draw one of the two dagger tiles, which will unify the two farms and connect these uh, two meeples. Hmm, Lord Trooper having a difficult decision. So do we go over here and score two points or do we block our own farm? And the answer is we block our own monastery because Daniel was going to enter the farm and that was a dangerous, dangerous threat. So Lord here 
with a city tile presumably gonna go at the bottom trying to add at least a couple of points to his ruin but only one meeple for the rest of the game with no chance of getting a meeple back this is uh, a sad sad prospect for the trooper which actually makes me a bit curious about other games I am going to try and maybe follow multiple games at once because honestly I have a feeling that it will be just extremely extremely hard for the yellow player to game a comeback and uh, maybe we can okay especially after this come on Daniel is gonna go over here I'm gonna get a meeple back and then probably he's even somehow m gonna manage to secure a meeple majority on this field I don't know how but he will do it or maybe or maybe uh, if blue goes over here, then somehow as yellow we can manage to block a bunch of blue's meeples. And then maybe like we as yellow sneak into the field in the last moment. So that could also work. What doesn't help yellow's prospect in the game is the 10 point scoreboard deficit. But what does is the fact that Daniel seems to have lost internet connection. So if only he doesn't have internet for two more minutes no that wasn't daniel that was actually maybe me or something up with board game arena but daniel did in fact finish the uh road for five points unified all the farmers and now also preparing to finish an eight point city if he gets the last remaining giraffe snack over here and also now he's gonna go over here and drop a farmer. I'm pretty sure that's the case. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There are still two curves remaining. There are some curve voids remaining. I think it's an easy decision that the Mexican player will surely find. Go over here, drop a farmer like this, and then have two ways in which the blue meeple could enter the field. And at the same time also create a field which is actually super closed. So once yellow, uh, once blue, against the meeple majority on this field it will be actually very difficult for blue to reinvade but i wanted to kind of start sneak peeking at other games what do we have we have i don't think we actually have a look at complex in this tournament they're still playing their first game Oh, it looks like they were practicing. Oh, no, that was the semi-final against Chile. Where they happen to lose what's going on over there. Playing against Sani Blader. Well, that's a gigantic city fight. Okay, this is actually pretty exciting. So uh, I'm just gonna, I just gonna really want to check if Daniel Ayala finds the move that I suggested, or they have another way of converting this advantage. 15 points on the scoreboard and two meeples. Like you should, one should not squander this. But here, this is getting spicy. We have a three, ver three versus two city majority for Complex, who's playing the red meeples against Sani Blader, who's playing the blue meeples. This is a gigantic city, and it also has, I think, some sort of reasonable chance of getting completed. There are no Doritos with a road that would fit over here, but there's one triple city with a road that fits over here. Triple with a ci city with a road, couple of city caps, and then blue will have... Uh, why blue? Because there's blue in the other game. Red will have a boatload of points but maybe red doesn't even need to complete the city because red will have a boatload of points anyway let me actually do a quick count that's 10 12 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 so it's like it's actually close to 20 points and the city will not be completed because sani blader draws the one tile that would have fit into this square and as a result, all these meeples are deceased, but probably Complex doesn't mind because Green has also a deceased meeple for two points. And I'll try to compare minus two points versus minus 20 points. And actually, the difference between this trap meeple and this cluster of trap meeples negates all the scoreboards lead, all the scoreboard lead that Sani Blader has. Well, almost uh, all the scoreboard leads as uh, lead as Sani Blader gets two points for the road 
Complex decides to cover up the city so that Santi Blade doesn't attack, but actually, actually, I would have preferred to leave this open and to entice my opponent into attacking this ruin so that I can block it with a straight line later. Remember, there are no Jolito tiles remaining with a road. And there are no triple cities with the road remaining. So there is nothing that uh, would have fit into that square in the event of an attack. Both turns exchanging quick points. Four points for the road for Sandy Blader, four points uh, for Complex. Still, Complex is having a meeple disadvantage. But uh, this is an interesting situation. Look at this. The fate of this eight-point monastery is tied together with the fate of the six-point road, which could become an eight point, a ten-point road in the future. Right, but of course, it would uh, then also add three points to this little red city, which is currently sitting there at one point. But overall, it is of course red who will be interested in drawing one of the two dagger tiles that fit into this square in such a way that um, gives them back two meeples, the city meeple and the monastery meeple, and gives a green back only a one meeple, a road meeple. So now Sandy Blader is thinking with his Dorito tile, possibly thinking of starting a new city. I love that move. He starts a, a new city in his own field, which he, sh he controls, which actually gives just that field, I just have to realize, gives Sandy Blader a massive advantage. So this one also appears to be heading, uh, well, this one appears to be heading Argentina's way. So... Well, from this game, we can see that Daniel did, in fact, find the move that I was suggesting with this beautiful farmer with multiple entry points. Let's uh, actually see later if he even manages to get into the field, if he at all converts. Still a 15-point lead on the scoreboard. Now a bit um, less as Lord Trooper gets four uh, extra points on the scoreboard. Now it becomes minus 11. And finally, Daniel gets one of the two remaining curves and enters this field which is completely locked this is just beautiful there are no entry points like no matter what yellow does it is impossible to enter because this is blocked this is blocked and around the field we have this big 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 road which sticks into the city this is pure beauty. I just want to enjoy this aesthetically. This is so nice. And um, on top of that, um, Blue still has a possibility to finish this city because there's still one of the giraffe neck tiles remaining. And on top of that, Blue recently meepled this ruin for nine points. And just to rub it in, this one ruin, which blue took in one of his last move outscores this eight point city which yellow was building with two meeples basically the entire game and unsuccessfully so uh, life is hard if you are the argentinian player and um we will be looking at the final position in due course, but as every, everything is decided in this game, we will be going back to Sanib later. So, both players find themselves without meeples. Let's find out I real quick, why real quick. So, Sanib later started a city on the right, hoping to complete it for a boatload of points, whereas Complex decided that it's time to drop a farmer because this farm is one, two, three, four, at least 12 points, probably gonna be more. And his idea is that he wants to get the tile that goes over here, give a meeple back to both players, then go over here, connect to the field and so on and so on. Sandy Blader gets a curvy tile and possibly uh, he can um, impede Complex's progress, maybe go over here and create some sort of pressure on this square. And this is exactly what he does. He wants to uh, try and block this field connection. Well, let's see if he's successful as the Mexican player completes the, per the first part of the two-step plan, which is liberating uh, his city and monastery meeple whilst allowing Sandy Blader to take only one road meeple. Still 16 points on the scoreboard for the Sandy Blader. This city gives a slight advantage to to complex 
but Sanya Blader is the one with control of the field and if he goes over here yes I think if Sanya Blader instead of finishing his city which is the intuitive move he goes over here and blocks this field connection then I think he's good now what else could we do maybe we're actually okay with red connecting into the field if we're thinking for it as uh, if we're trying to imagine ourselves in Sandy Blader's shoes maybe going here and simply finishing the city is an option because really the city is going to be worth 12 points which is basically the same number of points as this field anyway except that Sandy Blader gets a meeple back and he decides that this is the appropriate course of action however a complex get six points for the city uh, in the meantime we can see the points counting from the I uh, from the other game we'll see the points count count soon Sandy Blader in the meantime continues the city at the bottom well, this is a gigantic tile just look at this gets eight points for the scoreboard and also drops a farmer and also pr and also tries to take over this big field again so as complex I am now still not giving up because I'm now trying to desperately count curves one two three four five six seven eight which means that there's still one curve remaining which means that instead of connecting the farmer directly here's what we do we go uh, first of all we check the result as Daniel convincingly defeats Lord Trooper with 18 points that one mini point for Argentina but we go back to this okay here's what we do we go over here as red meeple a farmer then we hope for one more remaining curve and then we get a farmer like this and when we connect through here but this is not what he does there must have been reasons for this but there has to be a good reason why he's doing this and not even meepling the road equalizing this field will be not enough like this ruin is big but not big enough to mitigate the 30 point difference red will need to win this field outright and i think the way red w w wins this field outright is maybe if red draws actually if red draws A, uh, the crossroads. I've realized that there are two crossroads remaining. This one, this one, and there are two more somewhere in the deck. Which means that basically this guy is guaranteed entry to the field. And there's really not all that much that Complex can do. But by the way, the thing that I was suggesting would have worked. But oh, he has a better idea. He wants to connect to the farm like this. Well, Sani Blader, of course, is going to go over here. To connect into the farm and steal it and then complex is gonna go over here up top the farm will be tied uh well a beautiful field fight to complete uh, the game at the end but winning the field winning the field I is what was necessary for the mexican and this is just not gonna happen I mean, oh, there we go. <laughs> uh, my backdrop was <laughs> so impressed with Santa Blader's performance that it just decided to drop itself on the floor. You will need to excuse me for a little bit as I observe the toss being counted, but put it back and congratulate the Argentinian player for getting uh, the first little point for Team Argentina. Still one game to be played at least one well one victory to be had against complex if Sandy Blader wants to convert this advantage into a match point close enough I'm going to say 
uh, that's I'm not referring for the game. The game wasn't actually close at all. I'm referring to. Yeah, uh, it's going to be slightly crinkly, but we have no time to be meticulous about this. We need to be meticulous about something else. So, one point for Sani Blader and one point for Daniel Ayala. As the players will be taking a break, let's actually have a look at some other pairs. So, Herchu versus Manorori. Manorori won the first one, and now the second game is underway between these two similar rated players and it's actually it is uh, Hernan who has the slight rating advantage not that it matters that much plays a strong move which is actually really annoys this uh, mana Rory's road but before we analyze any moves in particular let's just look at the game situation as a whole we're still in our early middle game and I see a slight advantage for the play with the yellow meeples that's the Mexican on the scoreboard Herchu has the slight meeple advantage, 5 against 4, but 6 fewer points on the scoreboards. The brighter color of meeples is, of course, maybe a little psychological advantage. Mana Rory is now about to score... No, he doesn't score 4 points, he instead chooses to save his monastery. Again, understandable. Hoping to draw a starting tile that fits into the square. And then maybe draw something else that fits into this square. I would have actually, I would have been totally cool with this monastery getting blocked. But then I am sometimes quite reckless about my uh, meeples getting blocked. There's no need for other players to be like this at all. So, Erchu. Getting a triangle tile, starting, continuing their own city. Manor Rory now, of course, will go over here and equalize it decides not to meeple this and that makes sense uh, i think uh, there will be further ideas let's say if herchu gets a triangle then manorori can immediately put something over here to restrict the square even further and radically decrease the value of this red meeple but if red draws a splitter tile well then there's no real point of meepling this um, unappealing looking city piece by the Mexican player. So just a pure blocking mo move without a meeple investment is what we see. Herchu is now thinking what to uh, place, well, where to place this giraffe's next tile. Of course, this would have um, worked great over here, which is why, which is exactly why Mananori prevented these kind of shenanigans now hurt you will need to make some sort of awkward move or a move which i see which work quite nicely is over here uh to put some pressure on this road actually now that i think about this i think it's the only reasonable move in this situation because no not like that not like that i see what his idea is i guess like he wants to take a curve and then put this curve like this but the probabilities of actually successfully accomplishing stuff like that are less because there's still plenty of roads that Manorori can draw. Manorori can draw like a road monastery soon enough and meeple it for five points and then draw a regular city cap and then meeple this ruin for six points and then just run away with the game. So it seems to me that Argentinians playing with fire. This tile should have been placed a square higher so that this square is much more vulnerable and that yellow needs the same starting tile in both places here and over here below but this is not going to happen and uh, red gets immediately punished as Manor Rory manages to get his precariously placed road meeple back and this could very well decide the game as the play with the red meeples is 10 points ahead of the scoreboard has the extra monastery has the initiative has still a 75 percent of drawing a four point city tile over here has an open city cap where he's threatening to finish the city with the city cap and dropping a farmer and then trying to conquer this field 
Herchu, difficult decision now. He needs this tile for like five different things. One, we could finish our road because this road is about to get attacked or blocked. Two, we could go over here, continuing our city. Three, we could go over here, score four points, which is the move that I prefer, I guess. Yes, yeah, so he goes for the greed. Simply the highest scoring uh, move available. And four, of course, this tile could have been reasonably used on this city as... Certainly, if Herchu draws another big tile in the future, Herchu would want to hurt this yellow meeple somehow, try to block it. So, for example, now, I think as the Argentinian, we should go over here, try to invade this guy before Manorori gets a city cap of his own, finishes an 8-point city, and drops a farmer. I actually kind of forgot who won the first game. I keep forgetting this. This is not good. Uh, hi, Rene. I'm a bit late uh, reading the chat. That's not only because of a uh, one minute delay. Yes, so Herchu does find the strongest move, tries to connect to Manorori City, but Manorori is just happy drawing monasteries. And he gets a six-point monastery in the center. Now this interesting Dorito tile. Big decision for Herchu. Several good moves that I can think of. One is continuing this city. Adds four immediate points. Two is going over here, dropping a farmer, sharing the city points with uh, yellow, and also trying to invade and conquer the main field. But there were also other moves. For example, trying to block this uh, red meeple which red with this tile is now trying to prevent and the fourth opportunity with this tile would have been going over here at the bottom meepling this road and trying to equalize this road over here Manorori just adds one more monastery point like there is no tomorrow and he just is okay with getting blocked. This is a very interesting move. So Herchu probably now going to go over here. I think um, the Mexican is being a bit impatient here. I think uh, there was no need to lose an entire meeple like this. However, I mean two monasteries for 16 points. It's not like... Manorori is really in any meeple trouble. He doesn't really need the meeples back anytime soon. Especially now as Herchu will be probably investing a meeple upstairs to equalize this city. Or going over here. He's now thinking, which leaves me a bit of room. Okay, Mana Rory. Mana Rory won the first. Why? I should have remembered this simple fact. Anyway, back to this. As Herchu is thinking, I need to remind you all again to meeple the like button for the algorithm so that more players find out about uh, this Copa America tournament and competitive Carcassonne in general. And in case you're here for the first time, subscribe for more competitive Carcassonne content like this. There's more stream coming. There's actually probably one tomorrow if I manage to keep my voice after this. Because in addition to four hours today, I also streamed for 10 hours yesterday. Uh, as we were covering the entire Copa America tournament. So my voice is now like a little bit iffy, which reminds me, hot liquid. And of course, if you're feeling particularly generous, then I've enabled the super fa thanks button. Uh, and if you can afford it, I would be totally appreciative of that as well. Mana Rory scores four points for a road, but this at the same time introduces the opponent's farmer into the field. Herchu is now quite happily controlling a 12-point field with uh, two meeples. Although, it's not really much of a consolation given Manorori's scoreboard lead and the monasteries. The monasteries in the center, it's what's making the game 
you need not forget the two monasteries score basically as more than a 15 point field and especially now Mana Rory draws one of the two key tiles that were available to complete his monastery gets four points for the city nine points for the monastery and look at this beautiful road that one's also about to be finished so now that I'm thinking maybe Hertu was a bit premature in finishing the shared city maybe Hertu should have gone over here and try to equalize this road uh, because eight points for free for your opponent that's a really tough tough uh, thing to give up especially because field attacks were not urgent as there was always this field attacking point at the bottom which Mana Rory now uses so this is just almost unfair he spent some time with a meeple disadvantage building up the monasteries and decided okay enough of meeple disadvantage i'm gonna go fight for the field personally i would not have done that i think a better move was like meeple in the monastery somewhere or like taking quick points or whatever uh simply because if this field is small enough mana rory does not need it to win on the other hand what's wrong with trying to conquer a field it sort of forces uh, red to do something maybe red will want to get a crossroad tile and then go over here and then drop a farmer and then get a curved score four points for the road and introduce a red farmer uh into the farm like this to reinstate this majority for now this is still wishful thinking but this possibility is still mathematical in the mathematically in the air until Mana Rory has completed the connection with a straight line. Let's see if any of that happens. But in the meantime, the game, uh, the main events of the game are focused on the other side of the board. As Hertu got the splitter tile with a clear intention to try and finish uh, this city for like 24 something points. Uh, with the idea of using this meeple as some sort of insurance. So if... Uh, yellow as they did draw some sort of tile to connect to the city then Hertu can basically use this meeple to reconnect into the city but i wonder if they should really do that actually i think that they shouldn't yeah and i really like what Hertu did here because there's still a splitter tile remaining in the deck and if Hertu gets a splitter tile there's still, still two possible uses Hertu can go over here and prepare to finish this city like this with a regular city cap and there's still uh, two regular city caps remaining or he can go all the way and get the splitter like this place a meeple over here get one of the three remaining triple city tiles put it like this and then a city cap and score like 24 points or whatever for this field Mana Rory unashamedly adds one point to his city at the top to rise to complete it. I presume that Hertu will try to go over here and somehow prevent Mana Rory from doing that. The question is whether you place that move with a meeple or without a meeple that remains to be seen. But I do believe this square needs to be attacked because there are still tiles, there are still tiles that fit here. For example, one of these guys is still in the deck and I do believe two of these daggers are still in the deck so three tiles unacceptable i think this is not what hurt you should have done i don't think this is the way how you win this game as the player with the red meeples i mean red has his own plan red basically gave up on the field and he wants to have like a little majority over here if he blocks this square and then he builds up this ruin for like 10 points that would be doable but this threat of this city being completed is just too severe like we need to do something about this maybe now but you see now it's not as effective anymore because it's a very valuable tile well i guess you could go over there place it sideways and hope that your opponent does not draw the one remaining horse tile the triple city tile with the road that could work Imagine we go with like this, we leave it alone, and then we just hope that we draw the horse tile. The more I think about this, the more this move seems appropriate in this appropriate in this position. 
because this would force yellow to need the same tile in both places. Yellow needs the triple city tile with a road to connect here, or yellow needs the triple city tile with a road to connect over here as well. But with this tile, there are some alternatives as well for her to. Maybe he wants to invade this city with a second meeple and then get the triple city tile himself and then try to complete the, uh, complete the city. This is a viable win path. Or maybe he wants to go over here, add a monastery point, get a city cap, then another city cap, then drop a farmer and then sneak all the way into the field like this. Moreover, one, two, three, four, five, there are still three straight lines remaining, which means that this seems like an excellent move because after you place the city cap over here with the meeple, this monastery will still be live and red will be able to use one of the three remaining straight lines to put over here, get nine points for the monastery and a meeple back into their hand. So many good uses for this tile. And he chooses to do a completely different thing. Oh, this is also interesting, but I don't think it is the strongest. So the idea, of course, is to uh, start a new field and sneak in the farmer like this. But as a consequence, Mana Rory gets away unashamedly with 10 points for that city. And I think this is where Hertu's mistake might cost him the game. Dealing with that city threat was so important and he got the best tile in the deck for that. And look at this, he's experiencing both negative consequences. First of all, bl uh, Yellow City got finished over here. And second, now that he got the splitter, he blocked himself from using the splitter and he was now not able to use the splitter tile in the place where he wanted. And look at this, had he placed the splitter over here, he would have then had the square to place this tile over here and he, then he would have had his 18 point city and a meeple on a 6 point field and that would have been game over. Like, red would have won with a huge point difference but instead it's Manor Rory which is likely to win with a huge point difference. Like, this is how these swings go. One mistake, one imprecise move can cost you and your team everything. So if Mexico wins the bronze medal in Copa America, this game is why. Let's go. Mexico is saying Patricia Ayala. Uh, well, Mexico now is benefiting from your support as Mana Rory is on the, their way to win the game that, based on the tile run out, they shouldn't be winning. But still, Hertu's fighting. Hertu's still... Um, trying to take over 12 point field, respectable, here, here. Hertu still uh, having a lead in this ruin, but what Hertu is not having is this road. And even if Hertu gets this field and maybe even gets an extra city, which will give them extra four points for the city and three points for the field, so um, this field could get up to 15 points, still this road will make it so that the point difference, that the field will not be able to uh, overcome the point difference on the scoreboard. Mana Rory curving their, were their road to the right, possibly trying to prevent a road invasion. Hertu gets an interesting tile and there are many, many good ways to use this. I mean, he could go here, he could go here, drop a farmer, and then hope for another straight line and connect to the farm like this. Will he do it? Yeah, there we go. This is a real Brazilian field fight. I don't care that uh, Mexico and Argentina are countries which are not Brazil and not even Portuguese spe speaking. I know a Brazi Brazilian fight when I see one. But as Mana Rory, I think as Mana Rory, you actually should be okay with giving up this 15 point field, if I'm not mistaken, I might be mistaken, because you can just go over here, finish your road, oh, and meeple the city cap, and try to create your own field invasion platform. This is not what I had in mind, but I like that too. Hurt you is out there to hurt you and wins the crucial coin flip for the triple city tile with a road. So. Manoror is now not able to connect. Uh, Manoror now takes two points, but I think a stronger move was going over here and me and pre-meepling this road. Ah, 
Well, I'll explain later. This game proceeds at such a fast pace. Okay, hurt you. Gets. A tile that helps him win the field for 12 points. He's doing great. Nana Rory now needs to find something special. He actually needs to use all this time to know what the last tile is. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh no! That was the last straight line. So Hertu's not getting in here. Oh, that's a pity. I mean, that would have made the game closer. Or did I miscount? Well, whether I miscounted or not, that's irrelevant as... Not only... Oh, this is painful. So not only Mana Rory draws the tile that Red needed to connect to the field, but also Mana Rory drew the tile that helped Yellow connect to Red City, which Red worked so hard to protect. And I think this one move, this one mistake of not being able to stop a yellow city at the top cascaded in a series of negative events for the play with the red meeples. And this is the interesting situation. Mana Rory now won uh, with a over 20 point difference, but in reality, Hurt is the one who had the winning run out. That's why it has to be, I think, quite unpleasant uh, for my Argentinian fans and quite pleasant for the Mexican fans. Still, all is not over. Mexico is on the match scoreboard as Mana Rory defeats 2-0, continues to be a strong performer, and I get further updates that El Pitufo, who is also a streamer, uh, is having a decider against Leche the Killer, and Big Nacho is having the lead against Valpo 27. Let's actually have a look at LP Tufo because I haven't seen neither his nor Leech the Killer's game on stream yesterday. So that would be two goals accomplished at once and that would be a nice decider that we can view. Any other updates that you can notice are welcome. So 14 minutes ago is when they started their decider, eight tiles remaining, two evenly rated players in their 420s, 420s. And evenly scored on the scoreboard as P24 has one fewer points, one more point, but one fewer meeple. So Lichi the killer has this Dorito tile. Uh, so let's try and make sense of this position. So one monastery for black, that's Lichi and two monasteries for the Argentinian. One monastery extra for El Pitufo. Five points for the ruin for El Pitufo. That's kind of nice. So that's put them at like plus 11, I think. Plus 12. Lichi has an extra nine point field. So this is basically seven points. No, no, no. Nine, 12, 11. Okay, so Leech is losing by two points, I think. And now he gets another tile. Now he's winning by four points. So this is interesting. I presume that the field in the center, which is worth... Oh no, these are different fields. Okay, this is getting complicated. So the top field has three meeples on it. Two blue, one black. Which means that the field is controlled by blue. And blue has these five cities, so that's 15 points. The bottom field, well, it has not fully connected yet. It just needs one curve. But after a curve is going to be drawn, then black is going to have two meeples. And blue is going to have one meeple. And the bottom field is, is going to be also worth 15 points because of the five cities on it. Hi Mana Rory, congratulations for uh, the impressive win. We just saw that on stream. And uh, hi Mingo. As I see, most of my viewers seem to be rooting for... Well, no, not everybody. I see that we have many rooting for Mexico and some for Argentina. I want to see 
an equal number of Mexican and Argentinian flags in the chat for fairness. Pitufo gets three extra points by expanding their city ruin. Lichi tries to just win this game unapologetically with a farmer. Draws the farmer, tries to invade, and what will El Pitufo do about this? He draws a curve which Black needed over here. Let's see if there's still curves remaining. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. No, this was the last curve, which means that this square is uh, dead. So this guy is trapped with three points. This guy is trapped with nine points. And this guy is trapped with six points, which means that only a six points advantage for Lichi in that area. So actually, Lichi getting the curve over here was absolutely crucial. Moreover, it seems to me that Pitufo made an excellent blocking move because now this square also needs a curve, but there is no curve remaining. So life is hard if you're the mexican but let's see if there are any other tiles remaining that fit into this square and the answer is i don't think so all the three dorito not dorito uh what did you mean to say not dorito dagger tiles are out and all of the four crossroads are out which means that by drawing this one tile el pitufo prevented two of black's farmers getting what they want at the same time and a game which recently looked close and in which uh Leech actually had a couple of points of advantage looks like it is going to el um pitufo and this is something uh, that the team argentina will absolutely need as we get news from the chat uh, uh as daniel ayala has defeated war trooper a second time and given another point to Mexico, last tile for El Pitufo. Doesn't matter exactly where he goes. I do believe he's already enjoying a few points advantage. Probably going to get uh, five points more from the city at the top. Oh, I, for I forgot to actually make... Wait, 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 wait. Ah. Okay, I know. Yeah, there we go. I forgot to actually count the score. Anyway, anyway, anyway. We're back to this. Oh, so LP24 chose a move which scores them one fewer point. So a slight oversight on the part of Argentinian. This city was, of course, better. But it ain't gonna make a difference. Let's see what this final score is. I think it should be like plus... Plus loads. <laughs> and all because of one curvy tiles. Sometimes these Carcassonne field games are like this. Plus 21 points for the Argentinian, which keeps Argentina still alive into this match. They just need to win all remaining games. Uh, in order to win the title of the third strongest team on the continent. No pressure, just win all remaining games. So, uh, there's one jewel which we haven't looked at yet, and that is Big Nacho versus Vapula. I absolutely love the screen name Big Nacho, which I do believe has been derived from Ignacio. I'm not sure quite what the numbers are referring. And these guys are there in only their second game, so they're clearly taking their time. Which means that my most devoted viewers should be rooting for the Mexican player with a screen in Vapola, just so that they are more Carcassonne games to watch after this, just to experience the decider. And it does look that my devout Carcassonne fans will get what they want as the Mexican player who is controlling three bright yellow meeples 
enjoys a five point scoreboard lead, three monasteries for 20 something points versus a field by red, which controls one, two, three, four, five, six, six cities. This field over here, don't forget to include this city. And this is worth 18 points, right? So the monasteries are worth more than the field plus the scoreboard lead, but uh, Ignacio has a nice 10 point ruin over here. Actually, seven point ruin. This is an interesting visual thing, didn't you notice? It like, looks very big, but if you count the actual points, Oh, it's nine. It's nine points. Never mind. Never mind. And he also has this city on the right. And I believe that there is a genuine threat of completing this city. Let's just double check this. So what kind of tiles fit into that square? I see no starting tiles. None of these guys. So are there indeed daggers remaining? And the answer is yes. There is one dagger like this that would fit into this square. And uh, if B Big Nacho draws this, then this jewel will be over because these city points will be enough to overcome uh, the 20 something points from the yellow monasteries. Yeah, and on top of that, Vapul doesn't really have a good tile well maybe they can go over here and like meeple the road at the same time trying to prepare a blocking attack uh, or create an extra blocking platform against that square but they could also choose a different approach well they do choose to meeple the road and i rather like it but an alternative approach uh, for um this player would maybe to go over here and try to actually conquer the farm and maybe drop two more meeples. They chose the approach which is more intuitive and Big Nacho doesn't draw the tile that finishes his city but instead he draws a fantastic field. Yes. Oh, this is just a nine point move. So three points for this city and six points for this farmer. This is just deeply deeply unpleasant for the mexican and also they get a straight line they can't even block the square this is so unfortunate for them because if they go over here they only um help big nacho uh, they only make uh, the hole next to the square in the, in the exact shape of the tile that red needs so Vapolo needs something more creative. I presume a six point field move over here is the way to go. At least it seems intuitive. Or maybe just roll the dice, hope that red does not get this tile, and just score three points for the road, and then meeple the six point field later. Alrighty, alrighty. So we get news that. Stanny Blader 1 2 0 against Complex V and H, which means that we are watching the deciding duel between Big Nacho and Vapula. If Big Nacho wins this one, then the match is over and Argentina gets the bronze. If Vapula wins, then it is 1 1 and the match continues. Vapula chooses the field approach. Big Nacho gets the city tile. Well, not the city tile, but a city tile. And could do a variety of things. Decides to simply take two points. Vapula gets a road again. This is so beautiful. He can't, he can't block. So basically now it's a 50-50. He just needs to hope that... He just needs to hope that uh, Red doesn't draw a dagger. That's all that he can do. So uh, the move that we play is probably go over here, take three points, and now who draws the dagger? Will Red manage to finish the city? We will find in just a couple of seconds, and he does! He does draw the dagger. Big Nacho is about to finish like a 14-something point city and Meeple a three-point road or a farm, and that, I believe, will be enough to take this game away. 
Yes, Vapula has a scoreboard lead. Yes, Vapula has three monasteries. But this ruin plus this completed cities plus these menacing farms should seal the deal for Nacho. <laughs> but instead... Well, he actually makes a nine-point move, so it's also a strong move. But surely this was stronger. Wait, one, two, three, four, five, six... Okay, look, this was clearly stronger. Clearly stronger. Like, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. If this would have been a 13 point move, but Ignacio chose to take nine points. I think that these four points won't matter, but imagine if they do. Imagine if they do. Let's find out in a second. Monasteries are being scored, and Vapula gets his road scored, and he's sort of kind of ahead, but the fields. The fields are so big, there are three different fields that Big Nacho has. Wait, 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 wait. Ah, uh, no, it's gonna be close, but not quite, as Vapula is nine points short at the very least, and of course, six extra points for Big Nacho. Actually... Now that I think about this, did that last move even even matter? Because Ignacio got 9 points over here. And even if he just discarded the tall, he would have won. So did Vapolo have a better use for this tile? Maybe. It's it's very hard to say, but maybe the route for victory for Vapolo was like try to hope for this tile but also try to combine these fields somehow, or maybe to genuinely try to invade this field with two meeples. But it was very, very difficult. So this shows you that monasteries don't always win, that sometimes if you, if you balance them up with a uh, big farm and some cities, then you manage to overcome the monasteries. And for that, we congratulate Big Nacho. And for that, we congratulate Team Argentina with a strong performance over the course of two days. Beat everyone except Guatemala, by the way. So Guatemalans should also be proud for defeating the third... For, be, for being the only country to defeat the third place finisher of Copa America. But bronze medal goes to Argentina. And my congratulations to Team Argentina. Go with that. Commiserations to my Mexican fans still reaching the semi-final respectable performance and uh hope you're uh good at handling heartbreaks that's all i have to say well not heartbreaks just good good at handling losses well that was a bit quicker than i had hoped <laughs> it was only one hour uh, three two of course a minimum advantage and the final starts not now but in 53 minutes and I'm thinking what to do I mean I could make a break but I'd probably rather analyze a game or something actually I know what I'm gonna do since we didn't show Chile versus Mexico it would be fair to analyze one of the games of Chile versus Mexico. So I just will check quickly who was in the lineups. Okay, let's actually have a look at Claudio Jorquera versus Teos Gladiador. Two very strong players and Claudio Jorquera managed to defeat the... Uh, Or we could look at Rodrigo Amorim and Adan Laceras. Oh, okay, okay. So it's a tie. Okay, we have to watch this one. We have to look at the tie, right? So here's what happened. Complex uh, first won the first game. Then we had a tie. And then we had a third game. Okay, we have to look at this. 
I'm going to look at this from Claudio's perspective. This was the semi-final, by the way, so that was a couple of hours ago. And we're doing this simply to... Wait, what am I doing? So, complex is the first to move, so that makes sense. That's why the tie benefits at the Chilean player. And look at this, uh, quite high ratings for both of them. Okay, Elias is saying that the game was very interesting, the one that we already started analyzing. Lunch break, of course, is happening. Well, it's not lunch, it's dinner for me, but uh, in about 20 minutes when we just recap this game so the Chilean player with the green meeple starts a roads Elias also starts roads Claudio gets four points and both players are equal on the scoreboard Oh, Edgar is saying that your game was also fun against IMBD Noted. Maybe I actually want to have time for that. Complex is starting a new city and Claudio immediately chooses to drop a farmer like this. This is interesting. It certainly has its merits because eventually this uh, position looks pretty open and the field is important. But there are some negative scenarios how like a triple city is placed over here. And then a triple city is placed over here. And then basically this guy sometimes then uh, gets trapped. So probably what I would have done is just simply placed it over here and dropped a farmer like this, simply for the sake of adding of getting an extra robot point. But that move is also legit. And you see now Elias, the player with the red nipples, is the one who manages to drop the farmer. Claudio starts bl a blocking attack from the top, which makes sense. Complex starts a new road. Claudio continues with the blocking attack. Now only three tiles remaining here. Vulnerable square. So how will the Mexican react? Trying to build up efficiently, taking advantage of both the road element and the city element of the tile. Claudio is making a wonderful move. Look at this. Indirectly continuing the road and at the same time making it easier for them to connect to this uh, six point field of red in the future to basically avoid the exact same negative scenario that I was talking about um, like a couple of minutes ago. And also, this field connection will probably occur with Tempo as this is an excellent monastery spot. In fact, it is the best monastery spot on the board. So, whichever party draws a monastery first, they will be playing here. So, this farmer will get into the field basically automatically. Complex. Finishes the city, starts a new one. Claudio probably going to finish the city as well. Complex discards a tile. Uh, yeah, with some, with some thought behind this, I can see that it's like makes it. I don't know a fraction of a percentage. Basically, it's long to explain, but it actually makes it a fraction of a percentage point uh, harder to block the square. Um, so that's a strong move here by Claudio, disrupting the integrity of Complex's road. Claudio starting a new city outside of the field and also in a way that continues his role directly and interestingly actually I like this move so complex chooses to meeple the monastery not here not in the obvious spot but once the city has been completed this six point spot is actually well it's double edged actually maybe I would have even meepled the monastery over here with the idea of getting a road monastery and having doubles. But if we get a road monastery and we have doubles, then uh, somebody can place a city tile over here. 
and then both monas will be, will be blocked. So I like the idea of getting five points because it also puts pressure on this square. And given that this quadruple tile is out, if we get a couple of roads like this and like this, we can block this road meeple with two points. So that's just certainly a threat. And we are creating an extra monastery spot next to us. So the idea of stacking monasteries is still live. So great spatial recognition on uh, the part of, Mex of the Mexican player. Claudio continues his city and complex finishes his road for three points and scores yet another three points. Glad to hear that we are on the same page about the Triple City. I know there's a bit of a delay in the stream, but I am reading the chat. And Claudio makes a strong move, I have to say. Start a six-point field with lots of free squares to build new cities. Continues his road in a safe manner and also makes it slightly awkward for Complex to continue his monasteries. Because when Red gets another monastery, which is Red's dream, then this square will be slightly vulnerable and then maybe Claudio could get a road tile, stick it in there and uh, make it hard or impossible for Red to get his two meeples back. And this is something that will be quite important given Red's scoreboard lead. Complex is... that's an interesting move. I'm not sure about the reasons... of um, helping your opponent like this. Actually, I'm not a fan of that at all. Why would you do that? Because it sort of looks like it, like, like this road is becoming dangerous, but in fact, it's very hard to block this road. In order to block this road, um, Complex will need to draw this starting tile and place it over here then this meeple will be blocked. But Complex is getting a starting tile here, so he needs a starting tile for here anyway, so it's not like he can use it in two places. So um, it looks like it helps green more than it just bothers green. And the more I think about this, the more I'm getting convinced about that, because this also makes uh, the city of green slightly more secure. And this also makes it so that if Claudio gets a road monastery, he gets to score more points. And uh, if Claudio doesn't get a road monastery, he can get like a T-shaped crossroads, go over here and go over here and pre-finish this road. So I think we might have seen the first misstep of the game, but I'm curious to hear the reasoning about that. Claudio with a simple idea to finish his city getting closer on the scoreboard complex is now i don't know i mean it looks like a ah that's the tricky part about this so you see here we can see the strength of claudia's move because having this city piece next to your monastery is super inconvenient as red because if we go if we take this monastery and place it over here as red, as initially anticipated. Then Claudio can take this road, go over here, and genuinely block these two monasteries, because all three daggers that would have fit into the square next to the monastery have gone out. So this is just really annoying, and this is why uh, red is forced to use uh, a juicy monastery tile as a simple field tile, a decision which I actually quite agree with. VK is saying that red could have started a ring road on the right instead. Yeah, this is one of the options for sure, kind of going like this. However, maybe, yeah, however, maybe with the ring road, there's another issue that once you complete the ring road like this, then this square next to your city becomes vulnerable. So, um... Ah, Elias is saying that you wanted to direct this road to your blocked city. I guess I can see some scenarios how, for example, um, imagine if, uh, so you attack this field like this, and then green draws a curve, green goes with the curve over here, places a farmer, basically trying to re-attack, 
and then you get a starting tile and then uh, get a meeple and then you equalize that road. So actually, in that sense, it's a pretty neat idea. It's just I think it works out a bit less often than um, than uh, one would have liked. Um, but that's also a good question, actually. Okay, instead of this move, what's a good move? Uh, maybe we could have gone over here trying to put some further pressure on the road, something like this. But... Uh, it was a very difficult tile to use. I'm gonna, I, 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 I'm, I'm gonna give you that. Okay, so Claudio makes a hole shaped as a road monastery. All oh, these games are always so high variance. Like whoever draws the monastery first, and Elias does the same with the. Oh no, that's Clau. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, that makes sense. So basically, Claudio is making two monastery-shaped holes. As Elias was trying to complete his monastery, which makes sense. And uh, the idea of the play with the green meeples is basically to draw both monasteries, get 18 points, get his road meeple back, and win a huge field. Why not? I mean, 25% of the time, it is, in fact, gonna happen. <sighs> Complex. Gets... A tile that helps him start a city, which is a lovely idea. Claudia should block, which is great prioritization because we're not in a hurry to enter this field. We just need to make sure that um, Red does not get a Dorito tile soon enough that he can drop a farmer. So now, of course, there are still three Dorito tiles remaining, but at the very least, if Red gets one of these three Dorito tiles, Red will not be able to drop a farmer in a way that attacks this field too easily. Complex. Gets three points for the road. Claudia with a monastery. How exactly do we use it? Do we use it as a monastery? He decides yes. Strong decision. Because now Complex probably going to defend. And so, at the very least, green is getting some good compensation for when the city is getting completed. Claudia. Trying to meeple. Well, trying to attack this city over here. And Elias does not get a defense tile. I don't know. I would have, I would have taken. I would just. I would have taken two points. I can see the purpose of this. Why? No. 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 Take two points. Like here, here, anywhere. I see the purpose is like if um, Claudio gets a monastery, then it sort of kind of makes it harder to finish this uh, monastery. But then finishing this monastery is not the issue because if Green draws a road monastery tile, then Green goes over here and Green will Green can place a monast uh, meeple on the monastery and then Green will get this road meeple back. So if Green su can successfully meeple this monastery, which means that Green will not run out of the meeples anyway, which means that Basically, blocking the square is not such a priority. And given the fact that we know how this game ended, two points is kind of a big deal. So... Oof. Oof, that's rough. Claudio blocks Elias' uh, city. And the Chilean, I would say, now is much better in this position. Actually, now that I'm thinking about this, how did the play with the red meeples even come back also interesting that they didn't drop a farmer which makes sense maybe it's too early of an investment but somebody might use this a connection platform over here at some point so uh continuing with the blocking idea not many good uses for the tile and claudio just calmly starts a new city at the bottom and forces me to zoom out Complex starts a new city at the bottom. Both players are starting. 
Ah, and look at this. And Claudio is actually trying to save that square. So this is pretty interesting. Okay, now it seems to me that there's so many tiles that sooner or later somebody's gonna just go with the Dorito over here and meeple this and try to complete the city. There's just too much dancing around the square, like something's about to happen. But I love that in Carcassonne games where there's a critical square and a critical tiles, they're just been, it's like there's a storm or a black hole that it's like sucks in all the energy of, all the mental energy of the players and everything goes towards a small part of the board and then at some point, everything explodes, but we don't know when. Complex finishes the city at the bottom and at the same time creates an opportunity for a field attack with any row tile. So that was a very smart field placement. But now after Claudia places this tile over here, well, then there are just loads of field uh, farming opportunities with a Dorito over here, with any city tile over here. And it's really going to come down to the number of meeples in hand as to who's, who's going to win the main field. And given the fact that red has this meeple blocked over here, it seems that green has the slightly bigger chances, but red has the scoreboard advantage and three meeples somehow, despite having more meeples blocked. But not for long, as Claudio gets a meeple back himself. Complex now. Yeah, there we go. Now we, now we get a city. And actually, given the scoreboard leads and the monastery, and if as red we get at least one of these monasteries, then maybe we don't even care about that field. Because all things combined, the field is going to be like 18 points. Yeah, we can leave with we can live with losing 18 points. Claudio finishes the city, gets a meeple back at the bottom. Complex now uses the row tile to attack the field, but of course Claudio can instantly reattack at the bottom, which he does, trying to reconnect through a curve. And um, Reds is. Uh, Trying to make this farmer short. Now connects to the field. Claudio gets four points for the city. And at the same time, more options to connect to the field from the other side. Ah, And this is where having meeples is useful. Because if only red had one extra meeple, like red could have gone over here. And basically forced green to use a curve over here and give red six road points and a meeple back provided that this square of course were blocked but this is not going to happen ah i love this so trying to block the entry square basically preparing for the scenario where you draw both of the curves that go into the square and that way even though it doesn't happen very often it's still very nice to be prepared for scenarios like this and to be able to benefit. Um, Vika is saying fun to see both players building objects and not investing their last meeple. But this is something very interesting about how um, high-end experts and masters play with their last meeple. So very often, I mean, sometimes you have to invest your last meeple like on an eight-point monastery, on a city cap, maybe on a long road or something like this, or in a four-point ring road. But sometimes, especially when you're behind and you know that your opponent also has one meeple, you just need to sort of play this game of chicken. Like, I'm going to add one more tile there, one more tile there, and then at the right moment, snap, I place the last meeple, and then I complete the feature on the next move. It takes quite a lot of games to get that intuition when... Uh, this uh, situation is right, but I absolutely love that aspect of the game, knowing how to manage games uh, where both sides have a small number of meeples. Claudio now is ahead on the scoreboard for some reason, and Complex is just continuing with his city. Claudio, oh, that's a beautiful move. Pre-building a six-point road. And the reason why this move is so strong is the fact that it gives uh, Red a very tough decision. 
So there are two curves remaining. Imagine if red draws, draws a curve like on the next move. And then red need to decide, do I just drop the curve and hope that my opponent doesn't draw the second curve? In which case I'm doing just fine, as this meeple will be stranded here with just three points. Or, given the fact that I know that my opponent could draw the second curve, maybe I need to go over here myself as red and take six points for the field, knowing, despite knowing, that I would be letting my opponent into the field. And I'm doing this simply to prevent uh, green from scoring this six-point road in the future. So that's a very strong move here from the Chilean player. The Mexicans just taking four extra points to equalize on the scoreboard. Now Claudia tries to attack the Ruin, which makes sense. And now finally the first monastery belongs to Complex. 18 points on the scoreboard. And... Uh, <laughs> many, many ways to win the game, but oh, and immediately Claudio gets his second monastery. Oh, this is lovely. Well, this is fair. One for you, one for me. I mean, nobody gets to complain about luck. <laughs> and then suddenly this game, of course, looks very favorable for the Chilean player because... This guy worth 8 points, this guy worth 3 points, so that's already 5 extra net points for Claudio. Assuming that Claudio will eventually connect to the city and there's still uh, like uh, 4 tiles to accomplish that goal. But also, the field. The field has now, even though it's hard to see, it has 4 green meeples on it and only 3 red meeples on it. And you know what else is on the field? A lot of cities. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's nine, eight, eight cities. Potentially nine cities in the future. So that's a lot of cities. And uh, this means that we presume that we're going to see Complex attack that field a little bit sooner. Complex, creating an attacking spot. Claudio now could do one of two things. Could either defend... But I think a much better move is... Actually, what do you do? Do you just get a meeple back so that you have more firepower for the field fight? I think you do. And then you leave yourself three tiles to accomplish the actual field connection. But this is tricky because you need the Dorito tile to maybe go over here and try and drop a... F Wait, never mind, never mind. Uh, forget that I said that. Maybe you need the Dorito tile to go over here and drop a farmer like this. So I think we need to finish our monastery and this is exactly what the Chilean player does. Temporarily giving Complex three more points but not permanently. Complex gets an interesting tile. So we can either take three points or we can go here and attack the field with a very high probability of connecting. Or we can go here and attack the field, and then if we connect, we also get uh, six extra points for the road, which I really like, actually. I really, really like that. <laughs> so, what are our other possibilities? Um, another possibility is to go over here, drop a farmer, and then uh, hope for the one remaining starting tile so that we get to finish a five-point road. I don't think at this point in the game we're just desperate to do a 50-50, so I would go for either this move or this move, and I mean, it's more spectacular probably to go for this move, but let's see. Okay, so a, uh, uh, so we go for red goes for the field's connection from the top, which is a very fun idea. It gives immediate three points and like a huge threat of gaining five points for the road plus the field entry. Will Claudia do anything about this? Will he try to block or will he just go over here and drop a farmer of his own? To me, intuitively seems that having a farmer of his own is the approach, but uh, the Chilean actually agrees with me. Complex. Gets a curve. 
By the way, my idea would have worked. You place this tile over here and you put a uh, meeple here and you would have gotten this beautiful six point road. Well, anyway, I know it's like not a great idea to uh, determine the strength of the moves based on a particular tile run out, but. Hmm. Ooh. I see something interesting. So. As complex, we now get a curve. And uh, I kind of forgot that this guy is not in the field just yet. And then maybe as red, we should go, we should just forget about the six point road, but we should go over here and drop a farmer like this. Hmm? And then we try to draw the one remaining curve and connect to the field here through the outside leaving this guy stranded with three points let's see if this is what you do and this is exactly what you do okay this is the farm field uh this is the fun farm fights farmer fights claudio connects to the field and draws the one tile that elias needed over here so this is unfortunate for them but complex Okay, what should you do here? It's a great question. I presume connect to the field because I just don't see any better options. And now Claudio. Probably connects to the ruin, at least that makes sense to me. I assume they must have calculated that they have everything enough uh, to win. And Elias ties the field, I believe. Yeah, we can just do... Oh, oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, there was no way to prevent Claudio from winning. Because Claudio now gets the... Obviously, so there was only two, two opportunities. Like, either Green gets the curve, in which Green gets the majority on the field and completely obliterates uh, his opponent, or Green gets this... In which case, there are plenty of tiles uh, of places where he can score five points. So yeah, Complex gets the curvy tile. No good place to put that. And as a result, we can see... the result in a second and the farmer at the bottom actually ended up mattering it scored three points for Claudio we tied the game and of course the win goes to Claudio because he was the player with uh, who didn't start the game according to the rules of this tournament and most international tournaments these days so yeah, very exciting field fights, and it's very interesting how the tension build up, build up, build up around these monastery squares, and then bam, bam, suddenly uh, all uh, broke loose, and uh, every move is a farmer, or a field connection, or something like this, or a block, just so dynamic, and certainly this was a lovely field idea at the bottom, and how this guy ended up stranded was uh, also quite instructive as well well uh it was chile in fact who won not only this game but also that duel and the entire match chile is the only team to have suffered zero losses in this tournament so far and in 22 minutes they will be looking to bring their streak to a conclusion no that's not what you say basically to just continue their streak win against brazil and uh become the champions of Copa America and my Brazilian fans are determined to prevent that. Something like this. Anyway, uh, for those of you who are just joining, this was our post-game analysis of a semi-final match, which, uh, which semi-final duel between Chile and Mexico that happened a couple of hours ago. The bronze medal match between Argentina and Mexico happened just now and you can see the results on the screen. and. Brazil versus Chile are going to play with each other in 22 minutes. 
I will see you in 16 minutes for some pre-match banter. In the meantime, I'm gonna go rest my vocal cords, get some hot liquid, and hopefully y'all get some lunch. See y'all in 16 minutes. Have a good one.
Well, anyway. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Hmm. I believe this should be back at this point. Yes, we are finally back. So uh, sorry for the hiccup, everybody. No idea where it was coming from. But the first game of the final between Brazil and Chile is underway. So let's have a look at the position. Rodrigo Amorim is playing against Adan Laceres of Chile and it's a roughly equal position right here well uh, uh, the Chilean player who's playing the yellow meeples has four of those which is one more than his Brazilian counterpart because just now the player with the red meeples dropped a farmer for six points hopefully for more points in the future from the perspective of said farmer and um, this is why the Chilean player is trying to be very annoying about this. He is actually trying to not only continue the road, but also to restrict the potential of Rodrigo's field. And in fact, the reason why I'm a bit worried about this farm is because actually Adam Lazeras was one tile away. If only he were to draw a straight line, he would have actually almost completely boxed this farmer is in. But Rodrigo's move over here was super important because he was able to create more green squares on which to build future cities and expand the point value of said farm. Also, this road is worth seven points in its own right and Rodrigo technically has a bit more points available on the board. He'll be looking forward to getting a Dorito connect or getting a triple city like this and then try to get another triple city and a Dorito and a Dorito and a city cap and build a huge city with a two versus one meeple majority. And this is of course something that he called this monastery placement. I can see why, but I think the move is pretty obvious. It has to be over there. Not only it is the highest point scoring, um, the highest scoring point on the board with five points, but also it um, is easily completable. So this monastery is very hard to block. Also, if yellow gets some sort of curvy tile or anything that fits into the square, a Dorito, for example, yellow can go over here and put pressure on this vulnerable city of red with tempo. Uh, then, importantly, yellow takes away the same monastery spot from Rodrigo because Rodrigo had the same tile in hand. And now Rodrigo will need to either take this five point monastery spot, which is sort of kind of risky because then maybe Adan Laceres can go over here and try some put pressure on this square to which the red road and the red monastery would be tied. Or Rodrigo would need to go here, do it, do it, do it, do it. This is what I think about this. And most of the time it is in fact correct. But most importantly, why I love this opportunity, why I love this placement by, Chilean, by the Chilean player, as we see, by the way, um, some developments happening at the top. I will talk about them a little bit later. The reason why I love this development is because it controls all the good squares that red could have used for building cities. But now red is not going to build cities on his field because red will be forced to add monastery points to yellow if red chooses to build city is in any of these squares, which, which is why it's actually always a great idea to have a monastery developing in your opponent's field because at the moment the six point farmer is a little bit sad let's see if rodrigo manages to cheer it up in the long term 
But in the meantime, the Brazilian has more important things to think about, such as this city over here. As Adam Laceras drew a Dorito tile threatening to eat up this little one-point meeple, draw a triple city, draw a city cap, and maybe get away with a 20-point city, 20 city for himself, just at the last moment, well, not at the last moment, but close to the last moment, just as Adam Laceras was going to put a city cap over here, denying easy entry for his opponent into the city, Rodrigo grabbed a tile that is trying to invade this uh, city from the top. A very important move for the Brazilian player. Now let's see what the Chilean's gonna do with this city cap. I mean, uh, maybe he can go over here start a new city and possibly create the threat of getting a Dorito and then a triple city and then another triple city and then finishing the city all together. I think that could work well because other otherwise there aren't really good spots for scoring cities. I mean, there are these squares, but these squares are in Red's field and you don't really want to build cities in your opponent's field. The way you want to proceed with this is you want to get a straight line, easy, so uh, finishing the city cap and kind of meepling another city. The idea is always to like sneak into the city like this. And Rodrigo decides that he doesn't really have any good choice. And I have to agree with him, it's just a move that you have to, you know, like pinch your nose and just do it. Because there are all kind of other bad things that could happen. For example, imagine if yellow drew the one remaining splitter tile. Yellow could have gone over here, split off, and then just finished uh, the big city by himself. And look at that. This city connection turned out to be not that bad. As Adan Laceres does not draw a Dorito tile to take over the city. But instead calmly finishes uh, his top city for four points. and gives up on the idea of the city takeover. The city is now completely shared, well, not completely, like this square is still not filled, but there are still two tiles that are left, uh, which um, Rodrigo can use in the future to equalize the small number of points from this meeple with a slightly bigger number of points from this meeple. And look at this, Rodrigo discards yet another monastery, which sort of makes sense because it makes a city takeover impossible. But now that I think about this, given the fact that the Portuguese speaking player is slightly behind, maybe uh, we don't need to block that square. Maybe as the player who's behind, we actually need to preserve that opportunity for somebody, mainly red, getting a city cap putting a meeple and then trying to connect. That idea is long gone nevertheless. So uh, we are going to need to do something else if we're red, if we're trying to win. So the Chilean player is proceeding with the plan that I thought of like this straight line is such a beautiful move. It's making this farmer if not useless but severely impaired and also it puts pressure on uh, this square it makes it harder for red to complete this road a little bit easier once both players exchanged quick point moves on this part of the board uh, Rodrigo starts a new city at the bottom at the same time makes this monastery square vulnerable Mm. Oh, this is fun. So, road monastery over here. So, the initial intention of Rodrigo, I presume, was to get a city tile, put it over here, and block the square. Make sure that this monastery meeple does not see the light of day. But, with this tile, it's very interesting what he actually chooses to do. So, he could play it simple and simply score two points for the road, maybe like over here on the right, putting additional pressure on this square perhaps. Or he could actually YOLO it, go here, equalize the monastery and meeple the monastery for the sake of simply expanding this farm. Because if the road monastery is placed here or here, 
then the farm will be expanded but look at this this is very interesting i thought about this move and rodrigo's idea is to expand the farm but from the other side still preserving the possibility to block this square in the future i do believe there can be some problem with that and the problem is that yellow can still defend that square y yellow can for example grab one of the crossroads go over here meeple a monastery and then connect through a straight line to the field like this scoring four points for the road getting one extra monastery point getting a farmer in and then just playing the meeple majority to take over the farm again in the future with the tile that Adan has in hand, it's not really possible, but I think that is possible is going over here and sort of kind of protecting that square, given the fact that there's still one road monastery remaining. And this is exactly what Adan Laceres chooses to do. Oh, oh, oh this is painful. And so he chooses to try and connect to the field. And he wanted to get this road monastery tile but this road monastery tile instantly is drawn by rodrigo which makes it impossible for yellow to connect through here however yellow can still connect through here and that was the idea of this move there's still one regular monastery without the road and there's still a couple of vanilla city caps two vanilla city caps exactly so the same tile that you're seeing over here there are a couple of more of those in the deck and then this would take care of the job of entering this field in the meantime the chilean player is now putting pressure against the red player's road the reason why i was slightly surprised about this move was the fact that by expanding his field rodrigo also voluntarily restricted his road meeple and is now paying the price if not for that move this tile would have fit into this square giving back red a meeple and eight points on the scoreboard for this road but now he's forced instead to do something else and Adan Laceres is able to block this meeple permanently there are now no tiles that fit into this square and so Rodrigo got to ask himself if this monastery move was really worth it Adan Laceres gets a in case this um, yellow meeple never makes it to the field then at the very least he puts the city cap into this field so that this farmer can score a six point field or maybe even a bigger field on his own so it's like a contingency plan but uh the problem with this plan is that uh, rodrigo draws draws two back-to-back -back city caps and scores eight points and this is unpleasant if you're a fan of chile so Adan Laceras makes an interesting move. So he places the starting tile over here and this move has dual intentions. It's actually really beautiful. First of all, it protects the square. It makes sure that there still at least one tile, well, exactly one tile that can fit into this square. Whoops, do we have a stream delay? Actually, just didn't, didn't see that. No, I think we don't have a stream delay. That's interesting. Uh, anyway, back to this. Rodrigo. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I was saying, basically, Rodrigo is now going to think what to do with his curve, hopefully for a long time so that I, I can explain this. Uh, he, of course, makes it harder for Adan Laceres to continue his road, but the Chilean is unperturbed because he instantly draws a crossroads that fit here to score. For example, one that I'm seeing is there is one triple crossroads with a city cap remaining so that would uh, definitely work uh, is there something else I think no hopefully you don't get tired to the interruptions but it is Adan Las Eras who draws the most important tile that would have fit over here just don't place it here by accident just take some quick points and be okay with it Look, three points over here, absolutely lovely. 
this should be enough Adan las eras, which is only slightly worse than this 10 point city over here. And then you also have this advantage in this mini battle where you have four points for the block Neeple versus one point for the block Neeple. So that is plus 10. And then there's also this four point row that plus 14. Of course, red has this seven point row, so you're only at plus seven. But it does seem that if you draw one of the two Doritos or if you draw one of the one of the curves, then you should maintain a slight advantage. Uh, of course, this is all uh, if you manage to draw the, the monastery or one of the two tiles that do that go over here, and Rodrigo draws the first one, the tile that goes over here. He is not going to put it over there, behind, and not have many options how to win this game well of course the one option is just red could actually do. this would prevent both the unification of the lesser scoring yellow city with the higher scoring red city but this would also prevent the unification of this yellow six point field with this red 12 point field and it does seem that if yellow if red were to draw these two tiles then red would win but if red draws only one of these two tiles, then I'm sure that red is going to try and and um, go basically run for the city completion. He's going to want to go over here and try to get but I will be looking at other players too. Consequential and the main field for 12 points belongs to black and the secondary field for six points also belongs to black. So it's actually roughly an even game and a lot of that will depend whether Gustavo successfully completes his city over here and Gustavo as we saw from the previous games early today, absolutely loves field fights and manages to find spatially aesthetically appealing moves. And now his idea with this farmer is to draw a monastery, score eight points with a monastery like this, and place uh, and basically make this farmer join this black 12 point farmer. Well, if uh, WDE wants to counter that, uh, one, two, three, four, five. There is actually three straight lines remaining. So he could go over here like this. Meeple a farmer, get a straight line, and get a farmer in like this. Or if he wants, he could simply go over here and try to get the second farmer from the top, the one that he had already invested. So maybe he doesn't need to drop a new farmer. The reason why I'm sort of interested in this move is because this is the field connection spot that Aruda can use himself and if we draw uh, draw farmer here as black then maybe we can prevent Aruda from actually using that farming spot three points road over here or three points road over here but the reason why I like this farmer is because one two three four five six in addition yeah he does this he does this he's gonna well he found this that's uh, not an easy move to find because the reason why I love this move so much is because in addition to the straight lines, there are also curves and upon completion WDE can meeple this road and get to 
and basically score a eight point road out of nowhere and get a meter back that certainly has to be most appealing for the Chilean player the Brazilian in the meantime is the one who keeps drawing all the curves and there's now only one uh, all the straight lines and there's now only one straight line remaining don't meeple this don't 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 meeple this because there's only I mean I, I can see black's idea but black's idea should be like this right one two three four five six seven one two three four five six seven yeah since there's one straight line remaining you can risk for it you can hope for that one straight line but then you don't have to invest a meeple in this that's the main idea well uh, it's uh, doesn't make that much of a difference but it makes a bit of a difference Gustavo of course draws the nine point monastery and I one two three four five fifteen points for the field uh, that's 23 points that not nothing not nothing at all and this i believe should be enough to actually win the game for black so a lot will be depend well depend on whether the chilean player can get a straight line over here yep unfortunately i see that oh no i do get a bit of a better streaming thing huh uh do let me know if you can still hear anything i know it's gonna be a bit laggy no idea what to do with that again like fast internet here i'll try to uh look something in youtube settings for next time and like it was fine just half an hour ago but eh, it is what it is it is what it is so but gustavo does draw the last remaining straight line very unfortunate for the play with the black meeples as he <laughs> managed to didn't manage yet the super super important tiles well sometimes games are decided like this And it will be not as close as it actually felt during this game. Gustavo here with a complete sweep with a field domination. So how much is the point difference now? Gustavo's teammates are congratulating him in the chats as the field points are about to be counted. So 15 points was the main field in the center, the one that WDE seemed to have almost entered but not quite. And this in fact basically decided the fate of the game. Had Black managed to draw the straight line a little bit earlier, then uh, Black would have managed to join the field, get the meeple back, and score a couple of extra points to overcome this 20-something point difference. But it is what it is, and we congratulate Gustavo for a very strong performance in this tournament overall. Brazil is now on the scoreboard, on the match scoreboard. It is now 1-1. Let me try also something else. Okay, this should now be a little bit better. I think. As uh, the Brazilian will be looking to get the second match point for their team, they're one game up and in the second game, there are eight points up against Tito Arce. 
However, they're one meeple short, but I'm pretty sure that meeple is put into good use. Eight point monastery counts as a good use. Seven point monastery counts as good use. Seven point city at this point in the game, good use. And sharing this nine point field together with black also makes sense. This red meeple is sharing this other nine point field on the right together with black also makes sense, which is why Tito saying, no, 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 I don't want this. I want to take away this field from you. And Vinny is trying his best to prevent that, adding two points to his city and uh, making it harder for the black farmer to enter the field. Also, if uh, black is draw a tile, that can help him go into the field and such a tile does still exist but then black will be forced to add an extra city point to red which was exactly red's intention red also has a shared city up top which will not be unified together with a shared city at the bottom because there are no tiles remaining that fit into this square so this guy at the bottom will be forever trapped with six points now, after this curvy move, this became even harder for black to connect to the field, albeit still possible. Two tiles that fit into that square. In the meantime, black managed to expand his field, adding this little castle to the field. So that's extra three points. It does seem that Vinyle, the game is headed Vinyles' direction. What can Black do? I'm out of ideas. Okay, maybe we can think of something. So of course, Black of course needs to draw a tile that goes here. This will allow him to have a 12-point field. Great. Yeah, it's still not really enough because a 12-point field will put him in like plus four only plus four okay this city will put him at plus ten but then red has an extra mod and they are still playing their second game rodrigo won the first one and one tile away from the championship It does seem so. Yellow does have some comp compensation, some farmers, but it seems that it's not quite enough. Wait, there's the city at the bottom. Can Adan finish that city? Are there still city caps remaining? Surely that will be enough to equalize. I can see that there are no city caps for the road, so placing this tile over here won't work. But are there regular city caps? I can't see regular city caps either. Wait a second. Yes, 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 yes. So uh, it does seem that the idea to finish the city won't quite work unless I am mistaken. I'm sure the Chilean fans are hoping that I am mistaken. Thirty seconds remaining for the Chilean. That's an indication that he can't find a move that would give him good chances. So he instead decides to make a move that gives him the most points. Three-point move over here, connecting to Rodrigo's nine-point field, making sure that this field is shared. Well, actually, that's a three-point field move and a four-point road move. Rodrigo with a simple crossroad. Probably going to go over here and drop a farmer for four points. This is the best move that I can see. And this is exactly what he does. And the points are now about to be counted. 
GG is saying one of the Brazilian players, Adam Isabel, to add one point to one of his cities. And it's going to be relatively close because of the Luin at the bottom, but I do believe that Rodrigo has it. I'm not going to refresh, I'm going to wait for the points to be counted. Two points for Rodrigo City on the left. One point for this little bit next to the Monastery of Yellow. Seven points for Yellow's Monastery. These little bits and pieces of city accumulate. So how much for the big city? 11 points still looks like it's not going to be just enough because most of the farmers on the board are red. 9 points for the main field, 9 points for the shared field for both players and a little 3 point farmer up top. Make it so that Rodrigo Amorim with a 14 point difference wins the second game in a row against the Chilean Adan Las Eras and with that Team Brazil conquers the title of the strongest team in the Americas this year. Congratulations to all the Brazilian fans and also to all the Chilean fans for the amazing performance by Chile. Second place plus all an uh, unbeatable record just before the finals. But in the one game that mattered, Brazil managed to find what it takes. Rodrigo Amorim brings the decisive points and I am going to thank y'all for watching and the organizers of the tournament for being supportive in the streams and providing the or uh, the info super super quickly especially to uh, Team Mexico's Complex V and H. So uh, this is it. Congratulations to everybody. Uh, yeah, sorry for the lag. No idea what to do about this, but it is what it is. I hopefully it it will it won't uh, change the joy for the Brazilian fans that have now their title that has been well earned. Thank you so much for watching and I'm going to see you all soon.